good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, Tassian Symposium. Uh, that's the Targeted and Segmental Spinal in Anesthesia Symposium. Uh, this is uh, by the uh, Global Anesthesia Medical Education uh, Freelancers Group. And uh, we have a series, well, two lectures, and uh, this will be followed by a case discussion. There'll be case-based discussion. We have quite a few cases. And uh, this is something which we have been discussing on the Facebook group for a while. It's created a lot of interest quite a bit of uh, controversies. And uh, very recently, uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal, who is on the panel as an expert commentator, he will be, he's actually uh, written a review article and uh, that will hopefully uh, try to uh, allay all the fears people actually have about uh, the segmental spinal. Everybody seems to actually think of oh, what exactly or why should anybody be doing segmental spinal and can it not cause problems because we are being taught uh, that, oh, segmental sp uh, the spinal need to be at a lower end of the spinal cord. But if you actually look at the number of people who actually do thoracic epidurals, it's a huge numbers. And it's not uncommon for people to actually do dural puncture uh, during uh, the thoracic spinal. It happens all the time. Uh, but have we had any uh, kind of, uh, you know, cases of uh, spinal cord injury because of the dural puncture? If we had, we would actually have huge number of uh, cases in the court and uh, we would be, you know, they would have been stopped because of the safety issues. But thoracic uh, epidurals haven't been stopped uh, because of dural puncture. So uh, since it is uh, almost 11 o'clock, I will introduce uh, the faculty uh, to you today. So uh, we have named this Tassian uh, Symposium uh, TA also is our group, the anesthetist. So targeted and segmental spinal anesthesia. Like I said, this is by the uh, game freelancers faculty. Uh, our group, the anesthetist, where we are going live, uh, has got now, today itself, we exceeded uh, uh, more than uh, 24,300 or 400 uh, members. Uh, it's a huge group. So in coordinators, uh, we have uh, uh, Chetna and Preeti. Uh, Chetna is a pre private practitioner freelancer uh, from uh, Vadodara or uh, Baroda as it is called from Gujarat. Uh, she's done a fellowship in pain management. Uh, she's also ATLS instructor. She's also very active in the ISA as uh, she's a secretary of the ISA city branch uh, she's also in, uh, one of the members of the cultural ISA Vadodara. And uh, she's interested in anesthesia for laparoscopic, general urological obstetrics, uh, onco, and orthopedic anesthesia. And she has special interest in sedation for pediatric and radiological procedures. Uh, Preeti is a consultant anesthetist in private practice in Mumbai. Uh, she has special interest in regional anesthesia on lateral blocks, anesthesia for trauma, obstetrics, and she has interest in difficult airway. Um, the host today is uh, Kala, uh, who is a well-known freelance anesthetist from Mumbai. Uh, and we also know her from our expertise in uh, various uh, dance forms. Uh, she has great interest in uh, airway management, difficult airway management. She conducts her own courses in difficult airway. Uh, she is uh, an expert in no blocks. And uh, she has uh, also interest in finances. And, and she's done a uh, lecture for us along uh, with Sai 
uh, with us. The panelists uh, today who will be involved in the case-based discussions, uh, we have Dr. Rajesh Rao, who is again a freelance uh, practitioner from Mumbai, and his special interests are in uh, regional anesthesia, anesthesia for laparoscopic procedures and onchoanesthesia. Then we have uh, Dr. Nita Taneja. She was a HOD and senior consultant anesthetist, as she is actually, uh, from Sri Balaji Action Medical Institute, Delhi. Uh, she has special interest in regional anesthesia and pain management and pediatric anesthesia. Then we have uh, Richard Chandra, who is uh, an ex-professor from Rashtri Medical College, Bareilly, and has moved into freelance anesthesia, anesthesia practice and she has special interest in orthopedics, uh, anesthesia, and pain medicine. Uh, then we have our Ganesh Tendulkar, a senior consultant anesthesiologist uh, from Mumbai again. And uh, he's been associated with our group for a long time, and uh, he has special interest in regional anesthesia and onchoanesthesia. I believe a very uh, busy private practitioner. Then uh, we have Tarun Vagela, uh, who is also a freelance anesthesiologist from Napsari, uh, from Gujarat. He's also into, uh, well, he's one of the secretaries for ISCD branch. And his interests are labor analgesia, blind nasal intubation, segmental spinal, which he, he has presented quite a few cases on the group, and anesthesia for oncosurgery. Now we have also with us uh, expert commentators. Now, uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal um, has joined us, he's with us. I did send an invite to Roberto and Carmen and they did promise that they uh, will be able to join um, if possible. Uh, Roberto is on call today, uh, but he will try to join us and uh, Carmen might also join us at any time. So it'll be great to actually have their uh, expertise uh, as well on today's discussions. I think uh, with this, I will hand over to uh, Kala. Uh, Kala, over to you. Uh, Kala? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for the introduction. And uh, as a Tassian or a member of Global Anesthesia Society, I take this opportunity to thank you, our Dr. Shiv, on behalf of all the freelancers in India from every nook and corner to give us a voice and giving us dignity in our own eyes by empowering us with this knowledge and equality through our Facebook group. Thank you so much, sir. Begin with The disclaimer, uh, uh, we are like not to pass it. Uh, go on the, uh, uh, you know, pull this thing. You're still on the slides. Go on the slides. Oh, share. Okay. You know, slide show. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Huh. Uh, this is a disclaimer. Uh, we are not supported by any of the companies to promote their products. And these presentations here are all the presenters' personal experiences which we are sharing. And without much uh, ado, sir, I will invite Dr. Preeti to begin with a small introduction to Spinal. Over to Dr. Preeti. Thanks, Kalala. Thanks, uh, Das. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shiv, sir. And Kalakala Kala has done the Thanksgiving already. So there's nothing that I can add. Yeah. Is my slide uh, visible to all? Hello? Yeah, yeah. 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 Get, okay, go. fine. Okay. Uh, a very good afternoon and good morning to everybody who has joined us. Uh, I shall be taking a few minutes uh, for introducing. Uh, Spinal anesthetic techniques here. Okay. Uh, as we all know, spinal anesthesia was first given for a patient for, for surgery by Dr. August Bayer in 1898. He used a 3 ml of 0.5% cocaine for a patient who was due for a lower leg amputation. 
Uh, he tried this technique on about six patients and then probably he got a little uh, more uh, bold, I should say. And then himself and his assistant both injected cocaine into each other just to see how it feels. Uh, coming to advantages of uh, the spinal anesthesia that we commonly use, it's so widespread and so popular, mainly because it is cheap. It's very easy to perform once you have mastered the technique of giving spinal anesthesia. If you know your tips and tricks around the technique, it's very easy to perform. It's pretty reliable. You know exactly what is going to happen. You know it's very predictable, the train of events that is going to happen. Uh, they also say that blood loss is minimized or a lot lesser in spinal anesthetic being a regional uh, form of anesthesia. And uh, it carries a lower risk to the patient as compared to a general anesthetic and always ensures a faster recovery from anesthesia. Disadvantages, which are actually, um, what should I say? They are actually the effects of spinal anesthetic, but in the wrong hands, disadvantages include hypotension, bradycardia, cardiorespiratory compromise. You could have nerve damage, injury to the nerve roots, injury to the cord itself. There have been instances of cord transection, uh, infection post uh, spinal anesthetic, DVT issues in the susceptible patients, patients on anticoagulant therapy. You should know when to use it, how you can time your anesthetic and use it accordingly. How is our attitude? We are very relaxed when it is time to do a patient under spinal anesthetic. Uh, in fact, our surgical colleagues, uh, the other people in the OT also feel, you know, there, is a, there is a terminology that is used. People say that we are working at spinal level. Is it really that we are doing it at spinal level? What is the common thing we do? We explain to the patient, we prepare the patient, inject the drug. After that, what is it that we do? We just monitor the patient. Are we really working at spinal level? Let's find out. So here, what would our concerns be? Yeah. Now here, my concerns would be, during a spinal, is my level too low or too high? Is it just adequate? Once the level is going up or down, what, what sort of a level should I give? As a junior, these were my thoughts. Should I go in for a Trindelenburg or a reverse Trindelenburg to get the level that I want? Patients, as, as a freelancer, usually our patients are seen first in the OR itself. We may or may not have time to do a proper PSC in this patient. So we have no idea about the fluid status of this patient. Do we need to preload? Do we need to co-load? Do we need to find out if this person is uh, dehydrated or not? Am I going to encounter hypotension or bradycardia? If it happens, what do I do? What drug do I give? Should I give fluids? Should I give vasopressors? Should I give atropine? Should I start with adrenaline? Suppose a patient under spinal becomes non-responsive. Begins, we, we, we start with thinking about the diagnosis. Why is the patient not responsive? Is it a high level? Is there something wrong? Have I had an intravascular injection? Should I use a mask for this patient? Should I use pressors? Should I use head ups? Is it time to call a colleague? So these are the concerns. We are not really working at a spinal level. We are definitely using our brains up there. And it's not as easy as it looks. Some of our minds who are sitting are always thinking, can I tame this spinal? Can I use it to my advantage? Can I actually decide and limit the action to where I want it to be? Can I avoid or use the fluctuations in the blood pressure and heart rate to my advantage and to that of the patient? Can I use a, a subarachnoid block for a procedure that is higher up than an upper abdomen? Can I use it for a daycare procedure? Can I use it without realizing the, without uh, knowing too much about the fluid balance? Can I do it safely in a patient? That is what we are all going to find out about today. Thank you. Thank you. What do you, Kala? Back to yes, you, Kala. Thank you, Preeti, so much for showing that there's so many factors that alter the spinal block action. Patient characteristics, your injection techniques, 
the characteristics of spinal fluid characteristics of the local anesthetic agent itself there are some uncontrollable factors and there are some controllable factors the controllable factors will include your dose the volume the concentration the site of injection the level the posture of the patient and diversity of the la solution so i will ask dr chetna to explain about the diversity of the la solution and the effect of posture using the glass spine model dr chetna hello everyone the spread of local anesthetic solutions in the glass spine by dr Elia Scarry, Nafil Department of Anesthetics, Oxford Radcliffe Hospital. The first description of glass spine was made in British. Just a second. Uh huh. The spread of yeah. local anesthetic solutions in the glass spine by Dr. Elia Scarry, Nafil Department of Anesthetics, Oxford Radcliffe Hospital. The first description of glass spine was made in British Journal by Arthur Parker in 1907. He was professor of surgery at University College Hospital, London. The photographs of the glass spine model of Department of Anesthetics were first published in Professor McIntosh's monograph, Lumbar Puncture and Spinal Analgesia in 1950. It's essentially a glass tube curved in the same way as vertebral column with dural sac and subarachnoid space. It has a small cervical convexity, a larger thoracic concavity anteriorly, small lumbar convexity, and dural sac ends here at S2. There are differences between glass spine and the dural sac. The glass spine has a rubber injection port at the middle of the rumbar region. At the head end is a chamber to accommodate the extra fluid, uh, as glass is completely rigid and it is impossible to inject even one to two ml solution without there being some place for the fluid to escape from it. There is no spinal cord or nerve roots, and the glass spine is filled with normal saline as it has similar density as CSL. The specific gravity and viscosity. The specific gravity applies when temperature of both solution injected and the liquid into which it is injected are defined. Viscosity is more useful term. It refers to the density of the solution used to compare with CSF at body temperature. Hyperbaric when the solution is more dense or heavier than CSF. Isobaric if it is the same density as CSF and hyperbaric solution which is lighter than CSF. The first demo we are having is hyperbaric solution injected with patient in lateral position and then placed supine. The solution is made hyperbaric with dextrose and stained with vaccine rudimine. The patient position is lying on one side. The injected solution moves cephalite and cordite in the subarachnoid space. Finish the injection, take the needle out, and turn the patient supine. The heavy solution moves in both directions. Cordal solution can't move much. As cordic vein is being cut off, the cephalic solution runs very quickly in about 12 seconds up to mid thoracic region. If the patient is tipped steep head down, the solution will move only one or two segments up and then slows down again. If the patient is turned head low in lateral position after injection, the solution easily moves cephalite in upper thoracic, cervical, and even in the cranial subarachnoid space. Hyperbaric solution injected with patient in sitting position. A slow injection allows LA to trickle down into the lower sacral segments in cauda equina to give saddle block spinal. A fast injection allows LA to go up to L2 segment, but it will move very little higher up, maybe a segment or two. Hyperbaric solution injected when patient is sitting position, then placed supine. It is a very popular method. The injected solution cuts across cauda equina. Most of it goes down in the subarachnoid space. After finishing the injection, take the needle out and turn patient onto her back. LA runs both ways in the subarachnoid space. Dye and caudal end of the sac is quite intense as an unpredictably high proportion of the drug gets trapped in the caudal part of the lumbar convexity. Upwards, it runs to the lower part of the thoracic concavity. The spread of the dye is less intense, so less intense block to last a lesser time.
Isobaric solution injected with patient in lateral position and then placed to point. The isobaric solution is stained with methylene blue. As we start the injection, it cuts across cordycoina. Being isobaric solution, it doesn't favor the dependent site. It moves upwards and downwards slightly in the subarachnoid space. Take the needle out and turn the patient onto her back. The dye makes no effort to move cephalate or cordite in the subarachnoid space. The lack of dye in the cordite region doesn't make much of a difference as dye has cut across cordyquina. This type of block is good for operations on hip and lower abdomen as it is easy to block up to L1 or T12, but it can be very difficult to get these blocks to go higher. There are various factors affecting the effect of isobaric solution. The first one is temperature. So on injection, they warm up to body temperature, become marginally hypobaric, and then they may rise in the subarachnoid space. Internal barbotouch stirs the LA solution up in the CSF. Pregnancy, autocable occlusion causing engorgement of epidural veins may squeeze the dural sac and cause the block to go higher. And other unpredictable causes like coughing and straining may cause unexpected high level. Put the patient on side again. The solution makes no effort to move, it just hangs there. The effect of barbotouch This was used in former years to try and increase the spread of the solution. This involved aspirating the CSF after the injection and then injecting it again. It has a small effect in stirring the dye up, not considered a proper technique in modern times as the spinal needles are so small that there is very re little reliable effect of barbotage. Several minutes later, whichever position the spine is put in, the dye will just hang there and make little effort to move. Solutions injected through spinal catheter with patient supine. In late 1980s and early 1990s, there was a flurry of enthusiasm for using continuous spinal anesthesia. A number of manufacturers showed that the instance of spinal headaches could be reduced by using smaller needles, produce smaller subarachnoid catheters. Most of these were 28 gauge catheters, which would go through 22 or 23 gauge spinal needle. But one was 32 gauge microspile catheter, which would go through 26 gauge needle. But before these catheters had been used for very long, several cases of cordyquina syndrome were reported to the FDA in America. 28 gauge catheter and one ml syringe for injection as not much pressure can be used to pass solution down through the catheter. The patient were kept in supine position before injection. In saddle block, patient is lying in lateral position and then turn to supine position or sitting up and then laying down. But with continuous spinal, the patient is kept in supine position and then start the injection. So in 20 case spinal catheter, the hyperbaric solution traveling down the tube and then appearing at the tip of the catheter, which is passed caudally in the subarachnoid space. The LA solution trickles down in the way of saddle block spinal to affect only the lowest sacral segments of the spinal cord. As we continue the injection, a higher and higher concentration of the dye appears in the sacral segments, but still no block appearing higher than the tip of the catheter, which is in the, in this case will be L3 or L4 region. So it is useful in operations on the groin or saphenous vein or inguinal hernia operations. Still, none of the LA solution has spread over the apex of the lumbar curve. The tendency was then to inject more solution. It follows the same track down into the caudal end of the sac. So a large amount of LA solution is injected by single shot injection. And at long last, the dye is beginning to spill over the curve to produce a block which would be high enough for an operation on the lower abdominal region, but at the expense of very high concentration of dye and therefore LA and dextrose, which would be hypertonic in the caudal end of the dural sac. And it was thought that this was the cause of the nerve damage that these high concentrations of LA and possibly the dextrose were neurotoxic. Because of this, the FDA removed all small bore catheters from the market and the situation remains same even in US even after four years. But this ban doesn't apply in all countries of the world although some countries took the lead of USA. The anesthesiologist investigating the cause of cordyquina syndrome made various recommendations, including pre-positioning of the patient if the desired effect was not obtained with the very small dose of LA, stopping it at the maximum. 
and an alternative was to change the vericity. Isobic solution with blue dye, when injected, comes down into the tube, running into the subarachnoid space, but it isn't hitting so briskly and fast down into the lower sacral segments. So we continue the injection again like isobaric solutions. The block doesn't spread far and makes a higher concentration at the tip of the catheter. This doesn't run down into the lower sacral segments. So it is considered safe to use isobaric solutions in continuous spinal anesthesia. No dye present in lower sacral segments, therefore no LA and no higher concentration of dextrose. So since the 100 years when Arthur Parker first described glass spine model, it remains a uniquely visual method of indicating the fate of solutions of various varieties injected into the subarachnoid space with patients in various positions. This is supported by obstetrics associations, anesthetic associations, and produced by Oxford Medical Illustration. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. Beautifully explained glass spine video. Thank you, ma'am. Here we saw that uh, and understood how the hyperbaric drug settles down so uh, settles down according to the gravity and in sitting and in lateral position and how your isobaric works just one or two levels above. It doesn't spread according to the gravity. Okay? So at the site of injection, one level above and below, that is where your isobaric acts. Varicity is just one part which influences the spread of LA in SCSA and others include your bulk displacement, the injection current you create and the diffusion of LA through CSA just like Chetna pointed out. Now, can we tame the spinal? Yes, if we can avoid the gravity dependency, if we can avoid the hemodynamic fluctuations and the need for fluid pre or co-loading, if we can achieve higher and targeted levels without hemodynamic compromise, and if we al it allows early mobilization as in daycare, if it allows early voiding and discharge from the unit. And to know how, when, where, how much, and why, and other tips and tricks of the spinal anesthesia to make it more targeted to suit our requirements so as to provide safety for our patients and good working conditions for our surgeons, let's begin with our case discussions. The first case, a 58-year-old female with epigastric hernia, it's a routine surgery. The patient had undergone a CABG surgery three years back with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 30%. He's on anticoagulants at present. This hernia has to be done. I will ask uh, Dr. Rao to come and explain and tell us about how he will go up to it. This is uh, the 2D echo report. Ischemic heart disease with severe LV dysfunction, normal cavity size, but depressed systolic function. Regional wall motion abnormality is present. The interventricular septum, apex, and anterior lateral wall is thinned out and akinetic with grade two diastolic dysfunction. I did not take a picture of the hernia before. This is the post surgery. You can see how high the hernia is. This is your sternum, umbilicus. The hernia is quite high. Dr. Rao? Uh, Kala, can you stop sharing yeah, yeah, uh, the yeah, screen yeah. so that yeah. we can actually see the participants? Uh, considering the case history, my first choice would definitely be general anesthesia with uh, additional truncal blocks. Uh, but since this topic is on thoracic or segmental spinal, I would not mind giving him uh, thoracic spinal. The level is quite high. So I would target, say, C. T, T8, T7, at least Ziffy sternum, which is uh, T6. Uh, advantage is uh, I can target that level, go with a little, level, a little volume, 
hemodynamic changes are much less uh, as per my experience what i have done uh, but again it is not a uh, i would definitely go for a ga with uh, truncal blocks for this case but if you have to use isobaric or hyperbaric which one will you pick up a hyperbaric or an isobaric definitely uh, isobaric since it's available now yeah um, definitely 101% because uh, uh, hyperbaric uh, is a very uh, difficult thing it you know it just you have to be very careful with the volume the positioning of the patient to achieve the right level hemodynamic instability is a lot in that with isobaric we have seen that uh, even with uh, at the level which we want we give 2 to 2.5 cc is also it works well and for upper abdominal surgeries uh, uh, especially laparoscopic surgeries i have had a very good experience but again there is a limitation this is open because, sir this i am yeah, talking open, about yeah. open surgery yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah limitation is the first is patient has to be uh, patient compliance has to be there the surgeon has to be comfortable the most important with single shot spinals is uh, the time you know it yeah. should be within that time frame of 2 to 2 and a half hours to finish the yeah. surgery you can always add epidural to it yes yes yes, yes. or And, another thing as uh, just chetna has just uh, talked about i would uh, also consider putting an epidural i mean sorry continuous spinal catheter also especially if i expect it to you know go for a longer time if uh, in a single shot uh, spinal with isobaric which drug will you prefer a rupivacaine or a levobutrin so, so far frankly i'll tell you i have not uh, used rupivacaine mm -hmm. uh, i am using levo uh, and again levo rupivacaine um you have a good experience with rupivacaine but yeah. somehow whatever maybe medical legal or whatever i have not used it so far the problem with levo rupivacaine is availability now so people have stopped making the uh, 4 ml vials and uh, we have to make do with the uh, uh, sorry the 20 ml vials they have stopped making the ampules now yeah you can use the 20 ml use 2 cc for the spinal and the remaining can be given as a rectus shield blocks that's what yes, that yeah. way you that's do that's what, yeah. that's what, what about do. iv fluid requirements the mobilization catheterization as i said iv fluid requirement especially for such uh, yeah compromised heart patients very less is required compared to what we would require with uh, hyperbaric do you need preloading co-loading not at all not at all in my experience i needed hardly 300 300 ml absolutely fluid for a one hour surgery absolutely for this patient i would not exit 500 ml in that entire one and a half or two hours yes. i would not require also yeah. yeah and sir if at all this case is an umbilical hernia lower down or yeah. an inguinal hernia See that is the advantage with targeted spinal. You know, you yeah. can go down the levels. I need not give a higher block for an inguinal hernia. I need not give a higher block for an umbilical hernia. You can go at that precise level and you know uh, achieve uh, excellent an anesthesia, which is not possible with uh, hyperbaric. You have to do little adjustments. You have to increase the volume, maybe give that little head low, head high, whatever it is. it is a little erratic but with uh, targeted i know which level i am getting it's like transaction of cord at that level anything else you want to add sir dr tarun do you want to add something hello uh, dr vaghela yes, anyone else yeah maliwal sir we can definitely go for the uh, this uh, segmental spinal at uh, t8 or t11 level we can definitely give 1 to 1.5 ml isobaric drugs along with the any adjuvant uh, uh, maybe fentanyl or clonion what which are available and excellent hemodynamic step and no need to more fluids and even after post op also patient will uh, be hemodynamically uh, very much stable and the mobility and early mobilization can be done 
so, and so we can prevent also uh, any complications of this uh, compromised patients. This patient, I would avoid using clonidine. I would love to use uh, fentanyl or uh, buprenorphine. Yeah. Dexmedotomidin uh, is also an excellent uh, drug in this uh, cardiac patient. They behave very, very I'm, excellent. I'm, I'm again, I am scared to use Dexmed in spinal anesthesia as a mature. Uh, <laughs> it's individual choice. But uh, the cardiac stability is uh, excellent with the Dex, Dexmedotomidin. Dr. Palival, what will be your advice be in this case? Hello. Uh, Generally, these uh, epigastric and umbilical hernias are very superficial procedures unless the contents are uh, big or some intestinal contents or some momentum is there. Otherwise, you require very less amount of drug, uh, either uh, esoberic or even hyperbaric can be used very well. If the procedure you suspect is going to be a longer duration, then you can combine it with epidurals. Or along with the uh, low dose of isovaric drugs, you can combine it with the rectal sheet blocks. And the adjuvants you can use according to the patient. Like if you want a longer duration of action, then Dexmed is very good for prolonging the action of even one ml of the drug. You can prolong the duration of action by around one hour if you use a Dexmed along with this. Fentanyl will not uh, pull on the things very much. Dexmed, how much, sir? Around one hour, it can pull on with 1.5 ml of the drug. If you anticipate, just 5, 5 to 10 mcg. Okay, 5 to 10. 5 to 10 micrograms. Okay. 10 micrograms is, I mean, quite a big amount. And it can pull on the syringe. duration up to. So you have not hour. found any. any uh, you can use the insulin uh, syringe. Yeah, but uh, no change in, I mean, uh, the, the way we see when we give uh, dexmeritum in IV. It is definitely, you know, we can uh, immediately uh -huh. the pulp which is around. Usually, usually the uh, fluctuations are not much. No, no, with intrathecal use. Okay. Fluctuations are not much. Whatever I have uh, seen in these three, four years since I am using Dexmed, the fluctuations are not as like as uh, we are using in IV. Okay. Uh, with five micrograms, uh, almost nil. You can use hyperbaric drugs also at the same level. And depending on the, I mean, contents and uh, relaxation you need for the surgeon, if the patient is a male muscular patient, then hyperbaric drug can be a better choice. In terms of uh, relaxation, epidural. need of relaxation, sir, yes. the potency of the drug, which one will you prefer first? For relaxation, I'll prefer hyperbaric drugs. Hyperbaric, but at a higher is, level. Yeah, you can inject at the same level. And hmm. only thing you, you have to remember volume, is... Sir? Gravity dependent spread is to be looked for. Huh. I mean, once the levels are achieved, you can make the patient uh, straight. You can. Okay. That so is one of the reasons I don't, uh, I mean, I rarely use it in orthopedic, isobaric. The relaxation is a, I, I don't know, Ganesh might agree with me. Generally, the patients are very uh, old and uh, frail patients in orthopedics. So, relaxation is hardly an issue there. No, if you do not want more uh, codex spread, you can give it in a lateral position at a higher level and immediately supine rather than the sitting position. Yeah, in the lateral position. Preferred lateral position is preferred for hyperbaric drugs yeah. with low dose. Otherwise, what happens is uh, most of the drug will spread to the caudal lane and mm. the uh, desired effect may not be there. So that precaution. And you have the to next take. choice will be. And sir, you can combine it with the epidural. What if will you, you prefer, want a very uh, ropivacin or a levobupivacin in a isobaric? Mm, ropivacin is said to be uh, less potent than levobupivacin, yeah. potency-wise, being less lipid soluble. But with, so I usually prefer uh, levobupivacin. But with hernias, simple hernias, we can get Point. away with ropivacin. No, it's the superficial hernia, there is no issue. You can even use ropivacin. Even you, if the patient is where surgeon is very fast, even you can use uh, chlorprocaine. Okay. Up to 40 50 minutes and can work very no, nicely. What, I, what will you suggest for a newcomer who has to start uh, learning with, a, with an isobaric? Want to shift from an hyperbaric and learn. Yeah, better go with isobaric drugs. Better yeah. go with isobaric Hernias drugs, will be the uh, depending on the choice. size of the hernia and the surgeon's uh, competency. You can use 1.5 to 2 ml 
even if the level is slightly higher in otherwise normal patients it does not matter it hardly matters patients don't get discomfort even with 2 ml at t8 to t10 levels you can safely use that and that will provide a duration around 90 to 120 minutes with fentanyl as additive and if you use a dexmed as additive uh, it can give you a duration up to 3 hours so we do not need any preloading you know you don't have to push fluids but no generally not whatever the yeah so uh, what do we need there are, are very mean, slow and uh, uh, very gradual you you have time to on fluctuations yes you have time to uh, adjust Little, the fluid in the sense see, sometimes the patient may not tolerate na sir but then you, it goes on gradually not a drastic fall as uh, in uh, the for this patient with 30 ejection fraction you need to be very cautious you use the minimum amount of drug like i said 1.2 to 1.5 ml of the lubepurecan or either combine it with epidural you can use a epidural volume extension technique to spread the drug uh, 1 ml of the even isovaric drug can be spread to four segments above and below by using epidural volume extension using a normal saline so these are the different techniques which you can use for spreading the drug and according to patient you can time? change the Have you any time encountered uh, respiratory distress? Uh, not, not at all. I with mean, uh, with with uh, breast surgery, once or twice the patient said she had some heaviness in the chest, but she was breathing comfortably. Even at the levels of C C five C six, there was. Uh, I mean, I tested her fingers. There was no sensation in the little finger, but her grip strength was good. I mean, most of the time it is. sensory not motor with low doses that is the advantages of using isovaric drugs it is a selective type of surgery that's what in type yeah we'll come to, uh, for the breast surgeries later sir okay yeah are we done with the first case sir anything anybody yeah. wants to add Yeah, we need yeah, I have to. one question here from the uh, members. Uh, there's a question, very good one actually. Can we try epidural volume expansion technique for this patient? He's already so the cardiovascular complications. Has been already discussed, uh, doctor. Yeah. Uh, I already told you that uh, if you can give one ml of the solution and use ten ml of the normal saline immediately. Yeah, the dose is what's important. It is a yeah. it is a time bound procedure. You have to use it immediately. and isovaric drugs are better spread than hyperbaric drugs by epidural volume extension technique so you have to use a isovaric drug and 10 ml of normal saline immediately after giving spinal so that will uh, spread the drug to around four segments more than so, what, sir, what it should your, spread your view on continuous spinal catheter uh, for such a small surgery if there is accidental dural puncture with uh, Uh, epidural then i will go for it otherwise i will not prefer it no otherwise yeah. not only this case this is a superficial surgery otherwise if it is a major surgery uh, which requires uh, long duration of anesthesia or like you said if you add with a total catheter instead of that uh, you put a continuous spinal catheter you can go ahead with that but the surgery is very superficial i mean it can be done with uh, even with rectus sheath blocks and with short ga and uh, even people are doing that with just blocks and uh, this thing so no need to put in with a big risk of continuous spinal anesthesia especially when you don't have the uh, catheters available special catheters actually uh, uh, kala has mentioned that that patient is on anticoagulants i forgot to take that into account i just said okay, at that time you can avoid epidurals yeah yeah, yeah. And if at all you are giving CSC, sir, which what will be your level? You go at the higher level only, and or uh... no, same level. You can okay. with isovaric drugs. You can use epidural either before or even after giving spinal a level okay. above or below. Okay. Right, right, guys. No I think yeah. Well, or if you have that uh, combined spinal epidural needle, it can be at the same level. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I think uh, very good questions from the audiences about that. This patient is a cardiac patient, and uh, you also actually this patient is on anticoagulant. What anticoagulant was this patient on? And would you still likely go for a segmental spinal in someone who is on anticoagulants? 
actually so we can say in the end as we want to know i, I just uh, sideline that part of the case but anticoagulants uh, if patient is on anticoagulants depending on what anticoagulants is taking we have to take the call i think as of today only aspirin is allowed can give neuraxial blockages for all other anticoagulants we have to wait for some time yeah, so, sorry whose no? case was this who whose case yeah. was it sir it was my case the anticoagulants were stopped uh, okay. for 5 okay. uh, to 7 days previous to the yeah, the patient was just on aspirin uh, 115 yeah so you aspirin, need to i think you know the process yeah yeah so we need but to be clear still, that patient uh, need to actually we do still follow the uh, rules uh, which are laid down by asra or itra yeah. uh, where uh, we do not actually uh, you know do a central neural blocks for someone who is on active anticoagulants yes. uh, aspirin aspirin for spinal is still, still okay, yeah. but we uh, you know won't do it if unless the patient has had enough time you know if they are on clopidogrel so you need to actually be off the anticoagulants for at least for uh, uh, five to seven days yeah uh, can i go for the next case uh, uh, there are some more questions we need to actually uh, look at we need to be clear so i think uh, people have have been asking a lot of question need to be very specific and i can i request the faculty please don't interrupt each other if you want to actually please raise your hand there is an option of raising hand Uh, and try to actually let people complete so that the message given is very clear uh, so this was an epigastric hernia so the uh, looking at the incision the incision looks like it's around probably t8 to t10 so at what level the question is very simple at what level would you actually do knowing that this is actually the incision starts from say let's say it's from t6 or t8 what level would you be your insertion be the exact amount of the drug you're going to use levopipivir in what concentration ropivir in what concentration what volume what will be your additive and how much uh, dexmedrone uh, you have already said 5 micrograms uh, fentanyl uh, what is the dose you would want to use uh, can we actually have that clarity one by one please before you uh, proceed on to the next one considering the incision at uh, t10 t8 i would target t6 at least um so if i give isobaric i expect the level to go up at least one or two levels up so anywhere around even if i give it at t8 is i'm expecting the level to go to t6 maybe not more than 2 ml of uh, 0.5% levo uh, bupivacin and my choice would be a 25 microgram of fentanyl in this case anything you want to add kala because this is your case would you want to summarize yeah so the case uh, i had actually misjudged the level i went up to t10 and when the surgeon was dissecting about uh, the patient at the uppermost part had pain i had used isobaric uh, levobupivacaine 2 cc at the level of t10 level which was inadequate so i had to substantiate with a rectus sheath block after the incision and after that the, the um, with minimal sedation of midazolam and fentanyl patient was very comfortable okay. so you can misjudge the uh, level of your injection with isobaric then after injection you cannot adjust so you have to be very uh, clear with the dermatomes how much the extent of the surgery is and uh, in the sense the content of the hernia too absolutely absolutely i think that is uh, the message is that you need to have a discussion with your surgeon and find out what the level of uh, hernia is and also the extent you know you need to know if there going to be bowel contents are going to be there or how much relaxation so the communication is a very important part of regional anesthesia your failures can happen not because of your technique failures actually happen because of miscommunication and you're not communicated properly so you, if the yeah. surgeon said oh, i could extend up to t6 then you would be a lot more careful yeah 
And yes, that has been made very clear that if you're only using a segmental spinal, you decided for a segmental spinal. Yeah, in and the hyperbaric, you can give head low or you can change some position or something immediately. But with isobaric, you have to be very sure about your dermatomes. Yeah. But again, that is if intraoperatively, the level need to be increased or the surgery become more extensive, you do not have option unless you are using a catheter technique. Yeah. And you actually have a high risk patient in those cases. You need to be very clear from the very beginning that what technique you are, are going to use and how extensive the surgery can go. So you need to actually be aware that need to come from the surgeon and you need to discuss uh, with the surgeon. You don't want to be in the middle of the surgery saying that you gave the regional anesthesia uh, because you wanted to avoid uh, problems with general anesthesia. And then in, uh, you are actually giving sedation and other drugs uh, to prolong the uh, duration of the surgery. So that becomes that we have always discussed. You need to be very, very clear uh, in that situation. Okay. So dexmedomidine, uh, if you want to add, you said it was uh, five micrograms. Uh, fentanyl need to be uh, around 25 to 50 micrograms. Uh, doses about one microgram per kg on cause hypotension and sedation. So normally keep it to less than one microgram per kg uh, with fentanyl. Uh, itching is going to be a problem. It does still happens. It still happens. Uh, with lower dose of fentanyl. It's a known known thing. And I think Dr. Uh, Paliwal has already uh, said that I think uh, clonidine also is one of the choices. Yes. Yeah, again, but, so uh, clonidine- uh, For such patient, oh, yeah. for such patient will not use it. And it takes a uh, little time to act. So better is use fentanyl yeah. or dexmed. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, I think uh, this uh, case, I think we are um, very sure of what is. I think we have cleared uh, the doubts uh, from that. Uh, uh, just, I think there's one more question here. He said, Rupivacaine, are you using 0.5 or 0.75 color? Rupivacaine, I am using 0 0.75. 0 0.75, okay. Yeah. And how much dose would you use in this case? Um, Sir, in this case, I'll be using around 2 to 0.5. Okay. Yeah. 2, 5. two to 2.5. 2, 2 to 2.5. Propivacaine spreads very fast also, but, uh, but the muscle relaxation quality is poorer to your levobuprofens. Yes, it is It is more sensory blocked than, yes. than blocked. Uh, you if you were using 0.5, what would you do? 0.5, then I'll be going for a higher uh, volume. I mean, I may go up to 3 uh, ml. Okay. Uh, Ganesh, you had uh, something to say? No, I just wanted to ask, has anybody tried intrathecal ketamine or intrathecal midazolam, like what Carmen and all they practice? I haven't tried, but I just wanted the panel. Okay, we'll come back to that later on, uh, Ganesh. Okay. Yeah. We will discuss that uh, later. So there yeah. is one more question. Uh, yes, Chetna. Uh, how to add adjuvants without changing vericity? Uh, it, that's very simple. I think uh, we're not going to dilute the adjuvant. So if you're using 0.5, like Dr. Paliwal is saying, uh, how you, you need to use that concentration. You do not. So you're not going to dilute the uh, uh, clonidine into 10 mLs or 5 mLs and then use it. Don't dilute it. Use it as, as a concentration and use a, uh, a uh, insulin syringe or something like that to add, or some people uh, they say, oh, rinse the syringe with the uh, adjuvant. Uh, that that technique is also actually been used. So do not dilute uh, your adjuvant. I use separate syringes. Yeah, or you go yeah. separate. That's the separate other. Separate syringes. You can take insulin syringe or a two two ml syringe. Yeah. Okay. One more question, just does Dexmed behave differently in intrathoracic spinal as compared to LS spinal? I didn't get that question. What was it? Does Dexmed behave differently in intrathoracic spinal as compared to lumbosacral spinals? Uh, that would, I will leave it to Dr. Paliwal. No, nothing different. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar. Similar to yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kala, Can I go for the next case? case? Yeah. Yeah. This is a 40 year old coming with an IVF pregnancy. Uh, she would completed 36 weeks and was listed for cesarean section electively. She had developed left side pneumonia, had Krebs, basal, she had cough, and there was decreased air entry on the left side. Uh, she was being treated by a respiratory chest physician with antibiotics and steroids. And her incentive spirometry was limited to 400 ml. And I'd seen her on PAC, but then she developed herpes zoster, severe left leg pain. And the obstetrician wanted to deliver the baby as soon as possible. This was her X-ray chest. And see the left side consolidation. And Preeti, I would like you to do this case. How will you? Go ahead with this. In a so small have, nursing home, no ICU setup and limited staff available. You know the typical nursing home gynecological uh, obstetric hospital. Thanks, Kala. This is uh, pretty well, much what we see. Screen, please. Yes, sir. I'll stop. Okay. Can I go ahead, sir? Yep. Thank you. Uh, this is pretty much what we actually see on our nursing home practices. I have a pregnant patient, patient with a bad chest and with a virus, a severe viral infection. So this is a hat trick of immune compromise that we are looking at along with a nursing home setup. That means we are compromised. So the uh, main crux here would be to establish a good rapport with, between the obstetric team, the anesthesia team, neonatologist and the patient, most importantly. Now here the LSCS is confirmed. I would like to know how long the patient has been under the antibiotic and the steroid cover. If it helps, if we can wait for another couple of days, continuing with the antibiotics, we may have a chance at improving her chest condition, one. Secondly, we can teach her improvement uh, for, uh, we can get her to improve on her spirometry uh, values and uh, whatever inhalational therapy or rest or whatever else can be given. So the patient is less stressed and the baby is lesser stressed. If however, this patient comes to me for an emergency surgery, whether there is a maternal compromise or a fetal well-being is at compromise, maybe there's a non-reassuring cardiotopogram or something like that, I may not have time to really optimize this patient. Now, this calls for counseling and a proper multidisciplinary approach to the patient. Counseling regarding uh, the immune compromise that is there, counseling regarding the maternal health, which could deteriorate, putting the fetus at compromise, uh, peripartum. Uh, again, a uh, proper discussion about the pros and cons of general as well as regional anesthetic over here. I would prefer to do a regional anesthetic as I have been taught. And uh, my choice would go in either for epidural or a spinal anesthetic for this particular patient. Epidural is safer. I can keep a catheter inside, but it is also time consuming. So if I'm facing a fetal jeopardy and I have to do it on an urgent basis, I may not have time to cite a proper epidural if the patient is already in labor. She may not be cooperative as well. Uh, coming to spinal here with distress, I have again two options. I can have hyperbaric or I could use an isobaric uh, drug. Now, for a cesarean section, it's an open open uh, abdomen that is there. I would uh, definitely prefer to go into whatever is tried and tested. I'm very confident with my spinals, very confident, more confident with my hyperbarics than with the isobaric. I, I have to admit here that I have very limited experience with isobaric drug. Uh, I'm particularly not convinced about the relaxation that it offers because uh, I've been using ropivacaine, which is very poor as, from, uh, as far as muscle relaxation goes. So I would go in definitely for a spinal anesthetic for this patient using hyperbaric spinal, taking care about the upper level of the spinal. At no point in time would I try or uh, would I allow the level to go above T6 for this particular patient. And uh, of course, the plan B would be having a GA standby. Now, many of these nursing homes do not have a ventilatory standby. So here again, that possibility needs to be explained to the patient. So I don't want to really fidget around with the airway. So again, I would go in favor of a spinal anesthetic. Now, considering that the patient has already got herpes, uh, the herpes uh, zoster virus would sit in the dorsal root. So per se, the CSF and the main root of the patient would not be affected. So I think I could go ahead with the spinal for this particular patient. 
Is there something else you need to ask me? Kala? Yeah. I'm waiting for your question, Kala. Yeah, Neni. Uh, I wanted to ask Paliwal, sir, whether uh, regional or spinal in herpes zoster, is it is it contraindicated or it can be given? Hello. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Hello. We also yeah. have uh, Roberto and Karma. Uh, can we, uh, can yes, we all sir. call them in, please? Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Roberto. Sir. Hi, Roberto. We are very happy to have Hi, you here. Hi. Hello to everybody. Hello. Nice hello. to meet you. Nice to see you. Hello, Dr. Karmai. Hello to everybody. Uh, Karmai, your uh, Dr. Karmai. Mic, mic is uh, still uh, off. Karmai, your mic. I'll ask him to unmute. Mike, Mike, Carmine. Yeah, we need to switch it off. Switch it off. Yeah, that's it. Hello, Carmine. Hello. Hello. Nice to see. Uh, nice to see you both. And uh, warm welcome uh, to the symposium. We actually didn't know whether you will be able to join or not, but it is nice to see you both here. Yeah. Oh, sure. I don't uh, have a translation. Uh, your your English is fine. <laughs> uh, maybe they've read maybe have written English <laughs> because no, there no, is no, Google, speaking, Google Translator. <laughs> no, no, you both are speak fine English. Don't worry about uh, the English part. Uh, compression. Uh, our our problem is mo mostly compression. Yeah. Compression. Yeah. Okay. We can we can we can actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, you you can you you can help us by by reading in in the chat maybe. Yes, you can actually write in the chat and then we can read. We don't understand the question or we, we lose the, the meaning of the, of the discussion. Yes, yes, yes. So we can, we can actually put it in the uh, uh, chat box uh, to thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, like I said, again, uh, thank you for joining us. I, I hope to stay all, all the time with you because I am on duty actually right now. But I hope there will be no problem here right now. You can join in any time uh, okay. and leave us join any time. It's not okay. a problem. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we carry on now with the discussion part on the cesarean section. Uh, the question here uh, obviously is about uh, the herpes zoster. Yeah. Um, Dr. Paliwal. Yes, sir. Dr. Paliwal, Hello. whether uh, uh, herpes zoster allows us to give spinal in the first place? The patient is already on treatment. Uh, she has received antivirals and uh, also antibiotics. So during acute viremia stage, it is okay. usually a relative contraindication for giving spinal. Mm -hmm. But uh, taking the risk-benefit ratio of general anesthesia and uh, uh, spinal anesthesia in this patient particularly, I think the regional is quite safe. And there are many reports about its use even in patients with HIV. Mm, they have used even the epidural blood patch in such patients of immunocompromised state. The only thing is you have to document all the neurological problems beforehand before giving the spinal. And in this patient, she is having a lesion around, uh, I think, L2, L above L1. Sir, that comes later. <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, just now it's only it's the later <laughs> that slide was for uh, later once you decide it's final. But okay, now, okay. if uh, the question for Preeti is if you go for uh, isovaric, uh, what will be your limitations for this section for isovaric? You chose hyperbaric, fine, but if at all I want to have a uh, low uh, hemodynamic changes, or no, I do, I'm scared of hyperbaric, if it goes high spinal or no, something like that, and uh, I'm not able to intubate this patient, I don't want to. So if I select isoperic, what will be the considerations here? 
So here when you're using an isobaric, as I said earlier, my choice would be for a hyperbaric for this particular patient. But if I have to use an isobaric for any reason, I have to uh, also worry about not just the uh, thora lower thoracic and the upper uh, lumbar, but also the sacral fibers. Because many of my uh, surgeons, they have the habit of taking out the uterus for suturing. Also, when they are repos repositing the uterus inside, that again, or cleaning the gutters on both sides, that again causes a lot of stretch sacrally and a lot of pulling and discomfort to my patient. So here I would have to go really higher on my doses of uh, uh, an isobaric uh, agent that is there. And also, uh, by the time that it's time to close the patient, if there is any other issue which causes delay in closure or even otherwise half an hour or so and they're trying to close the patient, that is the time when the patient relaxation goes down. So here using an isobaric again would cause a lot of problems as far as relaxation is going on. You know? So you that would be my main isobaric uh, with an epidural. That will be ideal. Then. Yeah, yeah. That is definitely good. Yeah, a very low dose of an uh, hyperbaric, maybe a 0.5 or a 0.8 ml of a hyperbaric uh, so pupivacaine, along with maybe, you know, another syringe with, uh, say, 2 ml or 2.5 ml of uh, an isobaric drug. So I'm avoiding the hypotension and the bradycardia of the uh, hyperbaric while adding on uh, to the relaxation that is given to uh, my patient. Yes, that would definitely be beneficial. Uh, Dr. Palipal, uh, does pregnancy change the density of your CSF? And will that yes. affect your drug choice? Yes. Density of CSF is actually lower in females than in males. More so in pregnant than in non-pregnant patients and in premenopausal women than in postmenopausal women. Now, what does mean is the solution which is isobaric in males can act like a hyperbaric solution in females, especially in gravid, uh, I mean, pregnant patients. So at times you may get a very uh, promising effects with isobaric drugs, even in such patients. The only thing is it takes some time for uh, onset of action. So you have to be ready for that. If the surgery is, uh, I mean, urgent, then you can use a combination of drugs, just 0.5 ml of uh, hyperbaric and 1 ml of isobaric. Even 1 ml of isobaric drug can do at this level. Sir, uh, can I share the screen? I wanted to show the... Now, this patient goes for... Um... So now you made the patient sit for spinal. And this is the site. You want to give spinal. Now these are the herpesoster lesions behind at the back. Can go well above. I mean, no issues. Yeah. So Even at uh, uh, right from T10, 11 to 12, huh. you can go anywhere. Uh, you can use a hyperbaric 0.5 ml and 1 ml of isobaric drugs for How better effects. How much distance will you leave between the last lesion? At least 2 to 4 centimeters from the, I mean, the skin which is erythematous. Not exactly lesion, but the skin hmm. which is erythematous. And then uh, will it be hyperbaric or hyperbaric? I will avoid epidurals in this patient because you never know. Okay, Post-op the patient can have this infection, so better avoid epidurals. You can do it with single shot uh, spinal using two drugs or even uh, plain isobaric. Along with sedation if required, you can use Dexkit for uh, initial uh, taking out the baby. Dexkit is quite safe in such patients. Yeah. Um, Dr. Richa, Dr. Richa, do you want to add anything? Anyone else? from the panel. May I add something? Yeah, you can, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Here again, uh, you know, technically speaking, preparing the back for this particular patient is something I would be very worried about. Yeah, when you're painting the back of the patient, once it goes into the infected area, I would definitely want to change my sponge every time. So there's going to be a lot of wastage and proper counseling of the patient because this thing is going to burn. 
the moment you touch them it is going to hurt and as paliwal sir said uh, epidural uh, even i would not go into site one because it could cause a uh, flaring up of the infection and secondly again fixation of the catheter is like next to impossible you'll have to probably uh, you know pack the whole pack and do that which is not going to be an easy task you can use those uh... Uh, ioban or those uh, plastic yes, stickers yes, but with, whatever it you is you're going to have to hold off and uh, you will have to correct uh, correct you know, but it's going to be very uncomfortable to the patient site, yeah. correct 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 yeah that that is something that, that we have done on do, occasion yeah, yeah yeah isolate and then isolate paint the whole the thing, yes. site and then but again removal paint. of the whole thing is painful yes yes so that's not about that acute the time of the uh, Herpes zoster is known to have delayed neurological issues. You know, she yeah. will have pain maybe for months together later on. Yeah. So she has to be counselled that it is nothing to got to do with your neuraxial blockage. Yeah, that's what I said. That you have to document the uh, neurological deficits and all things, and you have to explain the patients. It's nothing related to this spinal anesthesia, but her disease can progress, and with uh, repeated infections. Uh, So regionals are not contraindicated. It is during the acute viremia stage only when it is relatively contraindicated. I mean, you have to see for the risk-benefit ratio of using either of the techniques. And in pregnancy, it is always safer to use regional in such patients with bad chest. So it is much beneficial than the general anesthesia, especially in this patient. Again, will you suggest a normal uh, routine cesarean to try with an isobaric before you proceed for uh, case where in your forced to you know choose between a hyperbaric or an isobaric and for this patient i will choose a combination of drug yes 0.5 ml uh, hyperbaric and 1 ml of isobaric because that will be a sure shot i mean definitive method Mm. Uh, so very at times may leave uh, lumbosacral sparing and that time you may have to use sedation initially yeah. but uh, double duct technique is a sure shot technique with yes especially in sitting that's, position that you have to was use very well position. explained at the glass spine that you could see the drug yes. settling down very nicely okay. i want to add uh, something ma'am Yeah, yeah, please do. Yes, yes. Uh, ma'am, I so I think in my opinion, isobaric uh, drugs should be uh, reserved for the uh, patients having cardiac disease in pregnancy only, or having a severe restrictive uh, lung diseases or obstructive lung diseases. Otherwise, hyperbaric they uh, do well with the fentanyl. Yes, yes, very true. Or that was uh, my initial choice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very comfortable with the hyperbaric. Hyperbaric. Uh, yeah. Yes. But the fentanyl should be added uh, if we are using the isobaric. I have used uh, this isobaric with fentanyl with the patient uh, having ejection fraction up to twenty percent in a uh, cesarean section, and patient uh, go uh, uneventful. And the literature is also there. Some patients also did the same thing. Uh, but we have to uh, look for the hemodynamic uh, fluctuations. The that is the only concern regarding the um, uh, this block. Thank you, Rich. Welcome, ma'am. I want to add one thing. Yes, sure. Uh, this patient has pneumonia as well as a viral illness, so we should be worried about uh, meningitis occurring in post-op. So since uh, we have no option or limited option. this also should be well explained to the patient and the attendants that although we will be giving a higher antibiotic that should be chosen but still it's a relative contraindication and should be explained that meningitis fact it has happened in one of our patients this patient was of umbilical hernia with a thigh abscess and spinal was given for the surgery well covered with antibiotics this patient developed meningitis in post op period actually these patients are on antiviral drugs so it should be continued both pre and post operatively applying to me as dr richa hello Hello. Can I ask Dr. Richa one question? Yeah. yeah. 
uh, ma'am uh, how much drug you are using for uh, high lumbar or low thoracic spine spinals uh, for cesarean sections when you are using hyperbaric and what for is uh, the dose uh, when you are giving at l2 l3 how much reduction you do sir for uh, hyperbaric if i am using at l3 l4 then i give 2 ml of this hyperbaric plus 0.2 ml of the fentanyl the total yes. dose is around 2.2 ml it is written in obstetric anesthesia books so okay. Okay. And, how, uh, how much how much is reduction you do when you are giving higher lumbar or low thoracic for uh, such cases if i am using um, at a higher level then i'll give a lower dose i'll give a total dose of around 1.6 uh, that will depend upon the height of the patient and the total weight she had gained during the pregnancy because uh, then i have to see the uh, the otherwise the patient is they are having the high bmi then i have to reduce the dose otherwise it can be done uh, in around 1.6 ml total with the fentanyl so around point so around 20% reduction in the total dose when you are giving at higher yeah. level you can you yeah, can sir. safely reduce that yes sir thank you very much i am asking because i am not doing much of uh, obstetric work that's the re reason i asked can i add Yes, sure, uh, sir. I I I hardly use uh, isobaric in obstetric practice, and in obstetric practice, I have never gone beyond L one two L two three level with hyperbaric, and I have never exceeded so far two ml of hyperbaric solution. But as particular to this case, I feel the lesions are almost extending to L one more above that. So who will give a hyperbaric? Uh, spinal about that in an obstetric patient. Priti, will you give uh, hyperbaric uh, uh, levobupin? Uh, with, uh, with her lung compromised, yeah. her lungs yeah. are nicely compromised. So you have to take care of that only, not only the lesions. Yeah. May I may I take that question, Kala? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question posed to me was a 37 week girl with a bad chest and severe herpes zoster infection of the leg. The back was seen only after she was made to sit up. Now I'm not sure whether these are two different patients or it is the same thing. Same, same. My patient's complaint had my patient's main complaint was leg uh, inflammation. So you, I walk in with a thought of a spinal anesthetic. When I make the patient sit up, I have done a couple of cases like this. Now here again, uh, when you make the patient sit up, if you see such a florid infection on the back, you know you first. For my, my first uh, impulse would be to just say bye and I'd walk out. <laughs> Second thing would be probably to call Doctor Ram, as you are very close by to me. <laughs> and then after that, maybe yeah, then then the brain starts working once it, you settle down a bit, and uh, then you start worrying and you explain, uh, you start thinking about whether GA would be better or spinal would be better. That's when again the second round of counseling begins. That surgeon needs to be explained because they cannot see anything beyond the uterus. Patient cannot see the back. She has not cleaned her back for so many days. She has not realized that there is such a florid infection in the back. Maybe it's time to call the relative inside and show them what is going on, and then give them on paper everything about GA versus uh, spinal anesthetic. So, uh, considering this particular patient, I think with such a bad chest, going higher up with a low dose of uh, isobaric, uh, sorry, with a low dose of a hyperbaric solution, maybe 0.5 to 0.8 ml of, an iso, uh, of a hyperbaric uh, pupivacaine, and then giving uh, isobaric would definitely help in this particular patient. Uh, whatever ropivacaine I did, I did two sections, I think, in ropivacaine, but that was only because the hyperbaric was not available in that particular uh, hospital on that particular day. I will not use opioid in obstetric practice. No relaxation. Okay, if, if, then he said, I so these case. are extreme circumstances where I was working in a totally rural setup where opioid was not available at all in the vicinity. All we had was opioid, and this was a distress case. Uh, case and we couldn't wait for uh, long, so I had to do it under spinal. I did not want to give GA to the patient, and uh, yeah, small nursing homes we try and. Push regional as far as possible. Maybe in an institute, I would have you know everything else at my disposal, and then like the place where I'm working right now has everything, so there's no problem. I can put the patient straight on ventilator, and nobody would ask me a question. <coughs> this case, finally, I did under Ropi Vacancy, and with 
the hyperbaric uh, 0.5 ml separate syringes first hyperbaric was given i waited for a minute or two so that it settles down nicely on the sacral segments and then the hyperbaric uh, then the isobaric peropivacaine 2 ml was given and absolutely no relaxation because this patient was very thin so i did not have much problem and i did not have levobupivacaine because that was not available uh, during some period uh, any questions sir yeah. so we can actually i think uh, uh, some of this case in a minute and before uh, we go on to the summing up uh, I think uh, there is a comment. Uh, uh, Kar Karman has actually sent sent it in return, and he says he would probably use uh, isobaric ripivacaine, uh, eight to ten milligrams, uh, that is three to four mL. He says the solution volume uh, with uh, fentanyl, fifteen micrograms, uh, or sufentanyl. Sufentanyl is not available in uh, India or in UK, uh, but is available in Europe. Uh, and you could actually use three microgram of sufentanyl. Uh, it's a lot more potent than fentanyl, obviously. Uh, so that would be that's his his uh, comment about this case. Um, coming to I think uh, here it's about uh, safety. Okay, so um, obviously if this patient did not actually have the lung lesions, would he go for GA straight away? Yes. Yeah. So question yeah. here is exactly that uh, uh, we actually have to balance about the complication of giving a spinal anesthesia in a patient who's got herpes zoster uh, because there were postules in the back. You could actually see one of them are ready to rupture. Yes. So viremia is quite possible, even despite the fact that this patient is on antivirals and on antibiotics. So you need to actually balance your risk. And Preeti has very well summarized, say it is about counseling the patient, consenting the patient, right? And um, I recently was actually doing a, uh, we have something called mandatory training on consent. And I love this statement. He said, consent is not about signature. It's not a signature on a paper. It is a process, process from where you start talking to the patient, obviously you need to document that. And here you need to be very clear with the patient. You say you have chances of turning up on a ventilator because of your lung condition or a small risk. We will take all the precautions that you might actually develop meningitis. Okay, both are can be, you know, quite life-changing. In one, obviously there can be death if the patient actually goes on a ventilator, not being able to wean in the other case, she might end up with, you know, central neural problems uh, because of the meningitis. Okay. So it is about risk benefit and we need to let the patient decide. Now in this case, if the patient says, no, I do not want you to uh, give an injection in the back, then you will respect that. Yes. Yeah. But again, the problem, this is a freelancer session this could be a condition where you are doing in a remote area where there's no intensive care. So there then the cost of actually transferring the patient to another unit. And that has to be again, taken into account whether there is a facility for transferring the patient if that is available. Now let's come to the COVID area because in India, the COVID is very, there's no ITU beds. So if this patient came to you now, would he actually offer a GA? No way. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Paliwal. Yeah. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, now, this option has become available just because the safety of uh, giving spinal at higher levels. Otherwise, yes. nobody would have thought this option about giving spinal to this patient. Mm. Even in spite of uh, the lesions, yeah. just because now the things are clear, we can give spinal even at thoracic levels. This mm -hmm. option has come in picture. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise the straightway option was only GA in spite of uh, her bad yeah. chest. And that's why we're having this symposium. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> Big Paliwal, sir, with us. <laughs> yeah, we have Karan, we have Dr. Paliwal, we have uh, Carmen. Yeah, yeah, and their expertise, total expertise. Yes. So, uh, this lesion Kala seems to have been in the uh, lower uh, sort of area. Lumbar, yeah. Uh, so, uh, what exactly was your level of spinal in this case? Have I missed that? Yes, sir, I uh, went at around uh, 7 8 rather. I went pretty high and I gave uh, 0.5 ml of uh, uh, hyperbaric uh, bupivacaine. I waited for almost two minutes mm -hmm. with the spinal needle in position. We by clock, the staff were watching the second turning. And then I gave around 2 ml of 0.75. But why, did, why did he go for T67? Because were they because sir, the Paliwal sir what? said I could feel the induration and it was the redness and thickness of the skin. Right. Okay. Which I was yeah. not very comfortable. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, that was again. I think uh, very clear uh, by Dr. Paliwal. It's not just the lesion. You need to look at the induration, look at the redness in the area, and go. Uh, two to four centimeters above that, look for a clear yeah. area. Uh, and again, this is possible only because of the safety of uh, segmental spinal we are discussing in these cases. Obviously, people are still reluctant. They still keep talking about, because there I just saw I comment, oh, what about spinal cord injury? What about spinal cord injury? Well, that has been very well explained. And I, uh, like at the beginning of the lecture, I said, there are so many cases of a dural puncture during thoracic epidurals. Now, you, there you're using a much bigger needle, which is almost 10 times the size of a spinal needle you use. So if you're not causing a, a spinal cord injury with an epidural needle, how do you expect it to cause with a, with a spine spinal needle? Okay, and there is a definitive end point you go, you feel a click, you get CSF. It's a definitive point. And again, uh, I mean, Dr. Paliwal has already explained in details how the distance uh, to the spinal cord from the posterior dura is actually greater in that region. So let's stop. Let me actually. add one more point, sir. When I got yeah. uh, long spinal needle is not easily available here. Yeah. If you see the distance from the skin to the dura, the lumbar, it's more than uh, the thoracic. Thoracic, yeah. you get the uh, spinal space earlier. So I have tried this uh, thoracic uh, uh, spinal in uh, obese patients wherein I did not have a long spinal yeah. needle. So that was beneficial there. You know? And I got ex good relaxation also. I mean, the surgeons were pretty happy. They were wondering 130, 140 kg. They will not be able to deliver the baby out well. Yeah. So that as another point, which was actually, I think, made uh, yeah. uh, in the comments. And this was, uh, I think, about uh, the relaxation, relaxation required. I know a lot of surgeons, this has been asked many times. They say, oh, my surgeon keeps telling it's not relaxed, abdomen is not relaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, but in multi paris women, uh, the muscle tone is actually markedly reduced. I can actually say maybe primary, there's actually their first pregnancy, maybe if she, but if these are multi paris women, the, uh, you know, abdomen is already stretched. So it's only about when the uterus, they want to deliver. After that, after that, it is going to be easy job because muscle is going to be so floppy and uh, easy to stitch. So I think relaxation is, I think, important only in the initial phase when they are trying to deliver uh, the baby out. You know, uh, some people like to actually make that a big incision. Or oh, rather saying that people like to deliver a baby through a smaller incision. Okay, I think in this situation, the other side, <laughs> that is not the situation. It's not about co cosmetic. You know, Indian ladies are not going to wear a bikini and go on a beach. Okay, this, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, Preeti, yeah. Yeah, Your, uh, this is just an addition for our younger colleagues and those who are uh, just starting out. Never forget the principle of primum non nocere. Hmm. Always, whatever you do, have the patient's best interest in mind. Do what you know 
if it's okay to not know something just because there are five options you have to keep them in your mind if you're not used to it if you do not know how to do it don't do a difficult patient alone as your first patient find a senior colleague who's experienced enough let them help you out get confident and then start off maybe with these isobaric uh, this you know, they could start off with simpler surgeries first rather than going in for these uh, difficult cases that's all i wanted to add sir yep okay yep i think uh, we can move on to the next case uh, kala next case yes next case dr neeta this is for you uh, 62 year old female for laparoscopic polycystectomy severe copd further x-ray lab call how will you go about it well uh, yeah Sorry, you hear me can that you is back of the patient so the patient also Hello? has okay, kyphoscoliosis yeah can Hello? can i be heard yes. yeah yeah yes dr nita you are very clear oh, yes okay so such cases uh, since the you know we have started doing segmental spinal i am getting such patients you know surgeons are bringing that this patient has been refused in such and such place and now you can do it in thoracic spinal or segmental spinal so segmental spinal has brought a revolution which i started uh, from the you know time of covid when it started before that i wasn't doing it so if such a patient comes they know very well that uh, they have a problem with chest and there can be a problem with the general anesthesia so it is very important that you explain the whole thing to patient because most of the surgeons feel laparoscopic means it has to be general anesthesia so you have to gain confidence of patient as well as surgeon counsel the patient well for the expected sensations that they might have during uh, uh, segmental spinal and uh, possibility of conversion to ga also should be explained anxiolysis should be done not only by pharmacol pharmacological methods but we can explain them and uh, so that they are prepared for uh, you know lying awake on the table with laparoscopic surgery so i would choose a segmental spinal and since we need a level from uh, t4 to say l2 or l3 uh, i usually choose a space around t10 it could be t9 10 or 10 11 and uh, use a isobaric levobupivacan 0.5% and about 1.5 ml mixed with fentanyl is good enough for laparoscopic cholecystectomies so uh, after giving you know preoperatively bronchodilators and steroids whatever the patient is taking um, doing the monitoring and knowing the oxygen saturation you would start oxygen and give the routine pre medication and give a segmental spinal and uh, they do quite well laparoscopic surgery under segmental spinal with this much dose hemodynamic disturbances also don't occur much the only thing is that you have to limit the insufflation of pneumoperitoneum i usually start with the 11 mm mercury and then up to 12 we allow so that's it you are mute dr kala i can't hear you yeah. uh, do you give sedation before the pneumo is set in or after when the patient complains if at all hello Uh, no i usually give uh, and uh, hello hello yeah hello i give i give uh, midazolam and fentanyl 20 mics and mm -hmm. if needed 
uh, 20 to 30 milligram ketamine can be given if the patient complains of shoulder pain. And okay. usually I have seen that uh, laparoscopic uh, work under segmental spinal is not much relaxed. I mean, the surgeon is happy with relaxation. Compare it to lumbar spinal, which people used to use earlier. You use a higher volume and the relaxation and shoulder pain, pain still occurs. Relaxation is a problem. Surgeon finds it, uh, people have to, you know, supplement with the propofol. Yep. But uh, with segmental spinal, just about fentanyl midazolam and uh, 20 to 30 milligram of ketamine. That's what it. about the huge abdominal breathing movements after sedation? Does it occur with, uh, generally that is a complaint with the hyperbaric? Yes, that is a complaint with hyperbaric and with the lumbar area uh, uh, spinal. It usually yeah. doesn't occur. Surgeons are very comfortable with segmental spinal. I have not uh, had a problem uh, since the time I started using this level and this dose and isobaric. And, and what changes uh, will you do with the same level, everything for a lap appendix or a lap uh, hysterectomy? Yes, for a lap hysterectomy, no, it would be different because there we need the sacral block, uh, sacral segments to be blocked also. So I usually make the patient sit and uh, give about uh, half a ml to one ml of uh, heavy bupivacaine first uh, with one syringe, followed by uh, isobaric two ml of uh, levobupivacaine with the second syringe in cases of TLH and even lap appendix. And I'm also using a mixture of uh, ketamine in intrathecally. Somebody asked this question and uh, I think it's a wonderful drug to be used intrathecally. The amount of sedation uh, required intra-op is less and uh, the post-op analgesia is also very good. It goes up to 10 to 12 hours with 20 to 25 milligrams of ketamine. So what I usually In do- the same syringe or separately? Yeah, I, what I usually do when I am giving hyperbaric, I mix fentanyl with it and make the patient, patient is sitting and uh, with isobaric, I'm mixing ketamine. And what about small procedures like uh, HL scopy, PCODs, diagnostic uh, laparoscopies and all? So any I mean, surgery that is going to last about, uh, say, 60 minutes, less than 60 minutes, you could even use a, a chlorprocaine -pro because now we are getting it preservative free. Earlier, there was a problem that the preservative sodium metasulfite was causing problems, but now uh, it's been made preservative free. So I'm using chlorprocaine and uh, uh, that's good Do enough. Do you find any hypotension matter in chlorprocaine? No, it doesn't occur. Doesn't occur. Doesn't and occur. Uh, volume? Uh, uh, volume about, uh, yeah, about 3 ml. You can go up to 4 ml, but 2.5 to 3 ml does a good job for perianal surgeries and for hysteroscopies. It is good enough. And in for fact, laparoscopy, I'm asking, madam. I'm asking for laparoscopy. For laparoscopy, I have not used chloro chloroprocaine. That's what I'm asking for laparoscopy. For laparoscopy, I'm using only levobupivacaine, not okay. even ropivacaine. Na, na, uh, Parish, Narish, uh, sir, you want to add something, sir? Yeah, for uh, laparoscopic Palina. surgeries of short duration, chlorprocaine is a very good yeah. drug. I mean, uh, you don't have to use the uh, higher spaces actually because the volume required is more. You can even use uh, lower lumbar spaces, L1, L2 even can do. I am doing all my laparoscopic TLs and uh, short duration procedures like even ruptured ectopic under chlorprocaine. So uh, the effect lasts only for 40 to 50 minutes maximum with 3 ml of drug. So you have to supplement either with multimodal analgesia before the effect wears off. Because the effect suddenly wears off. The patient is usually mobilized within 2 to 3 hours. My recent patient of MTPTL went home within 3 hours after operation with chlorprocaine. Lab TL and MTP. So it's a very good drug. 
and you don't need to give quite high because the volume you use is uh, more around 3 ml 3.5 ml 1%. depending on the patient and the procedure yeah 1% 1% only is available here we don't have 2% and 3% which is hyperbaric <laughs> We have uh, two experts yes. in uh, laparoscopic, uh, you know, procedures. Carmine and Roberto, please come in, both of you. <laughs> Carmine has actually sent a Carmine has actually sent sent a message, uh, but I think we would like him to speak. <laughs> Carmine, you can switch off, uh, switch on your uh, mic, please. You're off. Mic, mic. Microphone. Microphone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> Hai da parlare, Carmine. <laughs> was a message for him. Yes, 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 please. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. yes. Hello. Yes, Carmine, let's let's hear. I think you sent us a message about laparoscopic so uh, cholestectomies. Yeah. Drug. Yeah. Lap, uh, lap call uh, is very easy in uh, segmental spinal. But uh, uh, relaxation and uh, uh, compliance of the patient depend only uh, from uh, coverage, totally blocked uh, all the roots, uh, reaching. Uh, La, uh, third or uh, fourth cervical root. Mm. Uh, for this, uh, is um, is a very easy in uh, segmental spinal uh, T seven, T eight, T nine. Yeah, with uh, common dosage of uh, drugs. Mm. Mm. Eight, uh, ten uh, milligrams uh, of uh, heavy boopy, or uh, twelve, uh, fourteen uh, milligrams of ropi, bacaine. Every time the the patient uh, don't feel uh, uh, shoulder tip pain is uh, well blocked, uh, third or uh, fourth cervical root. For me, every time this uh, don't happen, relaxation is uh, not so uh, satisfying. Uh, the patient uh, uh, fight uh, against uh, the, the the procedure. Against uh, against the, the pneum, procedure. Pneum. Yeah, pneum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The relaxation depends on only from uh, a, a sensory blockade, not a motor blockade. Mm. For me, it's my experience. Mm. Uh, Roberto, I, I, Yes, okay. È per questo yes, che I... faccio la è per questo che faccio la la, la spinoperi. Spiegaglielo tu che non... per coprire di più, per coprire più completamente, dici. Completamente, sì. Ok. Spiegaglielo okay. tu perché io Sì, 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 ok. <laughs> allora, is uh, uh, Carmine Carmine is um, as you as you have listened he explained that in, in, in his opinion, uh, uh, relaxation depends more on uh, um, sensory coverage than um, uh, motor coverage. Yeah. Obviously, obviously it, it's also uh, needed a motor coverage, okay, a motor block. But sensory, it's very, very important, according to him. And uh, that's why he he want he want to he prefer to have a, a very large coverage mm. uh, and uh, pre preferably um, obtained um, by adding a epidural to spinal yes okay 
uh, or with uh, yeah. with uh, continuous uh, spinal or with it would be better with the continuous spinal but it's not always uh, at hand hmm. and so in this case they prefer a spinal combined with epidural but the this um, this uh, question this topic of reaching uh, so high roots at the uh, um, cervical level is something that uh, Carmine um, um, had an intuition eh, for a long time about this. Hmm. And then uh, um, he could uh, finally re realize and, and uh, put into, into practice this, this, intu in this uh, uh, intuition. Uh, having uh, a continuous spinal at hand, uh, hai capito Carmine, cioè il fatto che tu avevi in, in, in mente di arrivare fino alle cervicali, eh, però l'hai provato con, l'hai testato e potuto testare con la spinale continua. Ah, yes, sì. Uh, yeah, because I explained that, this to him. Because uh, having a, a spinal catheter, uh, you, you may always... Um, uh, put a remedy to uh, an insufficient block, for example. And so by, by tries and uh, many tries and a few errors, it was luck. And uh, even together oh. when uh, Carmine came to visit us. For a, for a, uh, for a um, cole, cole cystectomy, it's uh, very easy with the uh, uh, single shot spinal, but uh, for um, colonic resection, long, long lasting uh, surgery is important to have a cat catheter, yeah, yeah. Uh, epidural or spinal uh, for um, top ups uh, during uh, operation. Yes, this, Ma this maintenance uh, of uh, uh, so high yeah. anesthesia is yeah. uh, very challenging um, yes uh, for two three hours mm. uh, necessary um, um, programmed boluses mm. uh, in epidural don't uh, wait uh, regression yes offset Mm. Uh, is uh, difficult uh, after regression to uh, reach. Uh, come si dice di nuovo? The former, the formal level that uh, the yeah. former steady yeah, level formal that level, you, you yes. reached before. Yeah. Yeah. Maintenance uh, need uh, uh, early early bolus. Yeah, bolus programmed. Yeah, yeah. I think we in, uh, that in spinal that's in that's continuous that's spinal is uh, uh, easy to uh, reach. Um, in epidural is uh, uh, need time. Uh, many time. Mm. Mm. So this is not uh, not good for the patient for the surgeons to have a, a moment in uh, during which the the patient is is not feeling good is not comfortable because it, the coverage is is off is worn off yeah. and that's uh, one of the greatest advantages of continuous uh, spinal because the effect is uh, is mm. very very fast very fast yeah, yeah. um I think what's interesting to actually hear is that you're saying that uh, this sensory blockade is equally important. I mean, that motor may not be as important. That is that you're saying uh, motor blockade because if you're using uh, drugs like ropivacaine, you do not get as much motor blockade, but you can still do the cases just with sensory blockade. Maybe the is that right, eh, ha chiesto se il blocco sensitivo cioè ha detto siccome è molto importante avere il blocco sensitivo piuttosto che quello motorio è dimostrato anche dal fatto che usando la ropiva caina che ha questa differenziale di, di blocco differential yes, blo blockade, yes. It, but uh, 
uh, um, Boopy is uh, the same. equivalent. Is almost equivalent. equivalent. Okay. Okay. It's only um, only concent concentration is uh, important. Important. It's, it's so a question we, of, of concentration. It's even a, it's even a, a question of concentration. I, I use um, uh, often often I use uh, the xylocaine, uh, one person uh, work uh, well. Really, just uh, xylocaine, one person lignocaine. My peridurale. Epidural, yes. Epidural. 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 And how how quickly after the spinal do you give your top up? Because I think that was very clear that you don't uh, wait for resistion. So very how quick. quickly? Wait. How quickly after the spinal you give your top up? Uh, how much is the top up? And uh, duration uh, between two top ups. Uh, yes. Uh, Quickly, very quickly. Uh, Soon after. Two. Mm, Five minutes? Immediate, immediately. Immediately. After, okay. yeah. Immediately. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how much, how much one do you minute, do your top One minute. One minute. Uh, not more. Not okay. more. Okay. Okay. And uh, how much top up do you use in the epidural? Volume. Uh, Concentration the, the, volume. No, uh, normally, uh, I use uh, two top ups, uh, 10, mil 10 milliliters. 10 milliliters uh, of uh, each. Average. Yeah, uh, but which, uh, which drug? Ropivacaine 0.5 or 0.25? Che, che anestetico, che concentrazione? Uh, dipende dalla, dalla fretta. It depends uh, by it if, yeah. if he is in a hurry. Yeah, what do you, in a hurry, what would you use? One person lignocaine? Se sei, se di fretta con la lidocaina, yes, yes. He goes with si. the lidocaine. Yes. Okay, Lido, and Lido uh, Lido yes. one person lignocaine. Okay, 10 Lido mLs Lido. immediately after the uh, spinal is given. And for how long do you wait for the next top up time? Quanto aspetti per il prossimo rifornimento? Next top up, uh, um, 40 minutes for uh, Ropi Ropi, and uh, uh, six, 60 uh, minutes for uh, Bupi. Okay. And with lignocaine? E, e la lidocaina la rifai o non la rifai? Il top up no. di lidocaina. No, only for um, offset. Onset. So, onset. Initial, so initially First, use yeah. you can, and then followed by uh, Ropivacaine. Recuperare, so solo per, se mi serve per, per recuperare. Yeah. Il okay, top up it. di, di lidocaina solo per recuperare. Yeah. Eh, come si uh, dice recuperare? Non mi viene. It's, it's just to start uh, quickly. Yes. yes. Mm. And uh, what concentration of uh, ropivacaine or bupivacaine are you using after 40 or 60 minutes? Is it 0.5% or 0.25? Ah, concentrazione mm, dai top up sì. di ropi e di bupi. 0.25. Di solito, sì, 0.25 di uh, ropi. 0.25 ropivacaine. Yes. And mm. Bupi eh, 0.15. Uh, 0. 15 uh, Bupi Vacaine. 15, 1, 5. Max, yes. Eh? Max. yes. Okay. okay. Massimo. Yeah, so very, very low concentration. Of Bupi. Very low concentration, yes. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that is, that is very interesting. <laughs> I mean, wish we could actually understand Italian. <laughs> it would have been so much fun. <laughs> if uh, if the, blo the, blo the blockade uh, fade, mm. uh, I uh, change to xylo. Okay, mm. again back to xylocaine. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Rescue, rescue, rescue. Rescue is rescue. always xylocaine. Yeah, very interesting. I, th I think uh, 
this is something you guys have actually taught us on the group. So thank you. Thank you, Roberto. And thank you, Karim. You're Kermit. welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, Kala, over to you again. Uh, Mike, Mike Kala. I think we're finished with the question, sir. Yes, yes, I think so. Very I just want to add something. Yes, yes madam. Like for, uh, say, a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, where I know that it's going to go beyond 60 minutes, there, of course, we add an epidural. And uh, I usually top up the epidural after 60 minutes, not like the Italian people. They give it immediately. Yeah. Uh, till 60 minutes, the abdominal relaxation is quite good. And after that, I, for the intra-op surgical part, I use xylocaine with adrenaline because it gives a very good, uh, I think the best relaxation out of all three. And after the first xylo with ADR, then when required, uh, say another 40 minutes, then I would top up with bupivacaine or ropivacaine. Yeah. So are you using- Can I add uh, one more point? Yes. Hello. Dr. Nita, yeah, I'll add one more to... point. Sorry, Kala, one second. Yeah. yeah. Can we be clear with our concentrations and doses, please? Because you actually said lignocaine with adrenaline, but what concentration and what for volume? In, huh, for intraoperative work, I use 2% because I want a good relaxation. Okay. So two percent, uh -huh. unlike unlike 2%. what Carmen, I unlike gave. them, and uh, then followed by 0.5 percent bupivacaine, and it is only for post-op pain relief that I would use 0.25 ropivacaine or 0.125 bupivacaine. Volume, so, madam, volume. Actually, um, now since you have heard uh, Carmen speak, would you actually uh, change your practice to a lower concentration and uh, immediately use? Do you think uh, immediately, like I wouldn't use because that is the time of maximum hemodynamic uh, fluctuations that are occurring. I wouldn't use it immediately. Uh, and uh, the relaxation is good. So it's only after 50, 60 minutes, I would say, because that's when the abdominal relaxation is going down. It's only then that I supplement with epidural. And I think I would continue to do that only because we keep monitoring the blood pressure also. Yeah. If the blood pressure is down, I, I don't supplement. What volume? Uh, so can I add here? Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can okay. I answer? Uh, Madam is talking about hemodynamic uh, instability. So if you go low on your uh, spinal dose, suppose I give uh, and I use uh, epidural immediately to mm -hmm. expand the volume of your spinal drug, like uh, Palival sir said. And That's instead of true. NS, uh, I use uh, 2% adrenaline xylocaine in epidural. So immediately. It is immediately. So it allows me to go low on my spinal dose. So the hemodynamic fluctuations is much, much less. And at the same time, so many times it has happened to my spinal uh, uh, on uh, sitting position, I give the epidural. So the catheter is patent then. But once I put them to in the supine position, the catheter gets blocked because of some position. Even that is checked. Yeah, that so we not always in, a scope in the middle of the surgery key, you know, that I can adjust the catheter uh, mm. before the surgery starts. Yes, we always check and the epidural. It allows me to go low on my spinal spine. That's, uh, this, is what I would, this is what I would do if the patient has comorbidities, then I go very low on spinal and give an epidural immediately uh, just to expand the spinal drug. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shall we move on to the next case then, Kala? Yes, sir. Sir, but this was the case which we were discussing. Now, we have this sort of spine, the same patient. Hmm. So now, where will you go? Uh, can I ask? Uh, Dr. Nita, same case, sir. This is the lab call. 
So, uh, yes, we, we do have kyphoscoliosis in patients. And uh, yes, it is said that the spread is, you know, different. But still, you can manage to put in an epidural. And uh, um, I would still go in for CSE. Ganesh, Dr. Ganesh, what would you do? Hello? Ganesh, you need Say, to... I would like to okay. uh, go one or two segments higher at around like T79. If the surgeon is slow, I would like to combine it with combine, uh, spinal, uh, epidural. Or the surgeon is... Um, faster and we anticipate uh, the surgery to get over within an hour or so, then uh, two cc of uh, isobaric glue you can, along with fentanyl 15 microgram should be my uh, anesthesia for such cases. This is for uh, single shot spinal. Yeah, if it is a laparoscopic uh, cholestrectomy. And if the oh. surgeon is fast, and if you are anticipating uh, slightly uh, longer duration of surgery of the surgeon, uh, you know that the surgeon takes slightly longer time, then we can always combine with uh, epidural, as what Madam is saying. Now but I would give the, epidural at, uh, will you, uh, the direction of the, yeah. Will the epidural be in the same place as the upper level of the convexity, or will you go lower down and treat the catheter up? No, no, I'll, I'll give it at the level of the spinal only because I would know the proper direction where I'm supposed to go. And uh, I don't need to thread in much. Uh, three to four centimeters is okay. Anyone, else, anyone, add more anyone else would like to come in? Yeah, yeah. I want to... Uh, hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a short procedure. Normally, uh, if we are using thoracic uh, segmental spinal, then uh, it can be done with a plane, even in this patient. Either we can give a isobaric drug or the uh, hyperbaric drug, 2 or 2.5 ml, that is sufficient. And if the ultrasound is saying uh, that the, there are too many stones or there are adhesions, or the patient is giving a long history of cholelithiasis. That means we will encounter adhesions there. So for anticipation, uh, we can add a five microgram dexmin in that plane, um, our whatever we want to use, either isobaric or the hyperbaric. So five microgram de dexmin will give you three hours relaxation, but just you have to give uh, sedation uh, along with that. I use uh, this ketamine, midazolam, or butram with that. And I am uh, regularly conducting four or five laparoscopic cholecystectomy per day. Even I have started uh, using pediatric uh, uh, spinal anesthesia, but not thoracic. <laughs> Even uh, up to uh, six to seven years uh, kids with a lower intra-abdominal pressure and with um, using this lumbar uh, route. But I am using in the, those patients, I am using only hyperbaric drug with the fentanyl in pediatric patient also. Because laparoscopic causes sick me, they are considered to be a very short surgery. So I don't think ki I should use a epidural one, epidural catheter for that. Doctor Kamin, yeah, I think uh, Kala, what um, Carmen and Roberto or actually do they do? lot more extensive surgeries. Okay, it's like not these yeah, short yeah. ones. Yeah. Not, they're not talking about like simple lap coli. Yeah, day, day to day. They don't want to put a put a catheter for just a simple lap coli. Yes. So I think that is not a question. I think the question is about when they are doing, I mean, they are doing very, very complex surgeries like, you know, Whipples and uh, I don't know what. <laughs> it's very difficult to actually tell. So let's not confuse the issue uh, between yes. uh, simple lap coli and complex uh, uh, laparoscopic work. Okay. Yeah. We'll go for the next case. Sir. Yeah, let's go for the next case. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, go on. 
Yeah, sir. Uh, case four. This is for Dr. Rija. ECNL for a staghorn calculus. Sixty-five-year-old uh, female. Kala, Kala, you're not uh, share the screen. Share the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Want me to do it? No, I'll do it. Is it seen? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, just it is so twenty five percent. Can you see? Yeah, I need to go on uh, the uh, Slideshow, and again, yeah, it is true. Yeah, yeah. yes, fine. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Yeah, all, all, all. Yeah. Uh, PCNL, staghorn calculus, sixty-five-year-old female with diabetes, COPD, uh, ischemic heart disease, and a left ventricular ejection fraction of twenty-five percent. This is a X-ray. Doctor, it's all yours. How will you? Yeah, ma yeah, Thank you, uh, ma'am. It's a difficult case of an uh, old age lady with COPD, Look, diabetes. Can you the screen, yeah. please? Yeah. COPD, diabetes, and uh, ischemic heart disease. First of all, uh, I'll go for the basic investigations and uh, one ABG also, just to see the uh, baseline uh, PO2 level. And uh, I'll see the, uh, because it is an uh, elective surgery, and I'll see the if I can reverse the uh, obstructive component, uh, reversible component of the COPD, then I'll try to revert that. And I'll uh, control the sugars. And I'll, um, on table, I'll first uh, make the patient supine and then make prone without any anesthesia that whether the patient is able to lie down or not. If it is so, then I'll proceed for the surgery uh, by keeping all the parameters in the normal position, which I can um, like sugars and I'll continue all the drugs for the heart uh, for the same day. And for this case, uh, I'll explain. Uh, first, I'll take high risk consent, uh, like the patient may go on um, to the higher center if I am doing in a per peripheral setup. Secondly, I'll tell the surgeon if um, the your uh, procedures because it is a staghorn calculus and pay, he may need a, a supracostal puncture, so it may need a longer duration. So I'll do uh, I'll tell him to do it in two sittings, and I'll explain to the relatives also and to the patient also. And after taking all the consent, I'll uh, give a combined spinal epidural for this patient. Or I can give a, if the epidural catheter is not there, then I can give a plain, uh, iso, um, the plain thoracic uh, segmental spinal, but I'll use a dual block in this uh, patient. That covers your catheter, ureteric catheter. Yeah, right? yeah, ma'am. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, we have to make our patient uh, awake um, for this. After attaching all the uh, monitors, I'll give a uh, uh, T10 or T9 uh, level. Either I will give a single uh, shot, this isobaric uh, uh, levobifibacane plus fentanyl. The total dose should be around 2.2 ml. But prior to that, uh, I'll give a 0.5 ml hyperbaric bifibacane and I'll keep my patient. Uh, uh, in sitting position for uh, two three minutes. After that, I'll give this isobaric uh, liver BP again. The main problem, uh, the main uh, things which we are afraid of, uh, like uh, hemodynamic fluctuations, 
for uh, beginners or for everyone i want to stress on two things block should be adequate and we should not worried about the hemodynamic fluctuations as everything is ready on the table like uh, our uh, for the vasopressors uh, like we are available uh, having injection atropine and mefenteramine they are always av available at the uh, table so the main problem is with the uh, there should not be any hemodynamic fluctuations and my surgeon they don't put uh, uh, this ureteric catheter in lithotomy position they just flex the legs and uh, they just put the ureteric catheter and after that we make our patient prone and in prone uh, i used to make my patient uh, awake because uh, for that they have to hold the respiration so they have to follow the surgeon's uh, uh, orders like you have to hold the respiration so i'll explain it in um, before the procedure secondly i'll give a very less fluid because a lot of irrigation fluid will also uh, be going on so there are more chances of fluid absorption from that side also plus uh, uh, patients uh, i'll replace uh, initially by 2 or 300 ml crystallite followed by i'll give the colloids depending upon the patient's hemoglobin and the level of uh, uh, like we cannot calculate the uh, blood loss in pcnl we just see the flow and just see the color and so i'll replace it with the colloid after 300 or 400 yeah 200 or 300 ml of the uh, crystallites and we Sub don't uh, puncture do you take any care just breath holding uh and the block block should be adequate ma'am because if it is not there then i cannot uh, allow uh, them to the give puncture and from the left side if the stone is on the left side then you need to give puncture around t11 and t12 because left kidney is on the higher side in comparison to the right side there so you, you have, have to give only give only that will uh, decide titles. your uh, level of uh, spinal loss yeah and in normal patient i uh, did uh, many cases uh, matlab not in this case i did many cases of uh, pcnl and i compared this intrathecal dexmed uh, with intrathecal fentanyl and i presented a paper also uh, even it was published and i found that this supracostal puncture where are the uh, this uh, pulmonary complications are more so patient tolerated uh, intrathecal dexmed more in comparison to the fentanyl because it caused less pain it is ca it caused uh, profound uh, uh, relaxation in comparison to the fentanyl but in this case because of the so many comorbidities i'll go for the this fentanyl and i'll restrict my surgeon to if it is taking a too long time then do it in the second setting in between i'll give uh, some lasix also the main thing uh, is if we are using the regional anesthesia in this patient if suppose a surgeon has uh, developed any pulmonary complication uh, during puncture then we can detect early in comparison to the general anesthesia we can detect pulmonary complication in a early stage if we are dealing with the spinal anesthesia it is my experience do you use bolsters for uh, patients under spinal and uh, ma'am if we uh, if we are using uh, this spinal anesthesia uh, for this pcnl then we don't use bolsters because it decreases the uh, intra abdominal pressure in even it is also recommended that if we are using the spinal anesthesia then there are less engorgement of the epidural veins there is uh, less chances of in increase in intra thoracic pressure so there are less chances of bleeding we just make the patient prone and uh we do the procedure thank you uh, aliwal well, sir anyone else wants to add something okay, most of the things she has already cleared so it's better always to do such patient in combined spinal epidural with a very low dose of uh, isovaric drugs yeah. the pcns can be done in a single shot Uh, isovaric drugs also without uh, doing it in two drug combination especially uh, when using 
uh, a little bit of higher dose so that there is early sacral involvement also with when you use around 2.5 ml of the drug it takes some time but uh, within 10 minutes there is some sacral involvement and the effect wears off wears off after some time after 60 70 minutes but if you are using a dose around 2.5 ml then there is no need to use two drug technique if you are using a little less dose then you can combine it with hyperbaric and isobaric drugs for pcnl yes sir anything else sir Shall we go ahead with the next case? The only problem, ma'am, uh, which I uh, faced is the uh, patient. Uh, they complain of nasal congestion because of this intrathecal dexmet. So we used to do uh, give this uh, intranasal or treven for the those patients on the table. That gives them immediate relief. That is the only disadvantage I faced. I have found it more with uh, clonidine. So I don't nasal congestion. I have found actually. it more more with clonidine okay. rather mm -hmm. than dexmet. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, itching is more profound with fentanyl. I mean, it's very horrible at times. Yeah. We'll proceed with the next uh, case. Ma'am, I want to add some uh, one more thing. Yes, sure. Uh, um, if the uh, we have seen the literature also, and we have also faced the patients with the scorpion bite, and our uh, this hyperbaric uh, bupivacaine is not working. in those cases this isobaric levobupivacaine uh, that works well in any case good point yeah i think yeah it this is the always advantage ki uh, uh, if there is a scorpion bite none of the la works spine but this works work. yeah isobaric works yes ma'am very ma interesting very very interesting very interesting yes sir thank And you okay let's move on to next case now yes sir the next case is a case of fracture femur a uh, 69 year old male for fracture femur fixation who is a diabetic hypertensive ischemic heart disease and a patient of chronic kidney disease with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 20% has undergone ptca is on anticoagulants takes dialysis on every alternate day and also has a history of pulmonary cox with fibrosis this is the x-ray picture dr ganesh how will you go about now now this case uh, diabetic hypertensive pulmonary cox and uh, other multiple comorbidities like ckds and alternate day uh, alternate day uh, dialysis uh, ideal for me would be to wait for 5 days so that uh, clopidogrel action is tackled with if the patient is only on plain uh, 75 mg of uh, aspirin we can go ahead with the regional otherwise uh, if the patient is on clopidogrel then we'll wait for 5 to 7 days uh, earlier days when we used to have only hyperbaric uh, drugs uh the hypotension issue used to be uh, very significant and we used to always go with uh, epidural or combined spinal epidural with the availability of the isobaric drugs uh we have another armamentarium or another option nowadays uh with slightly higher lumbar uh, single shot isobaric dupio uh, can leo uh, we can uh, injections of uh, say around 1.5 to 2 cc we are able to manage such cases of dynamic hip screw or uh, pf nailings uh, but if the patient is for bipolar uh, hip replacement then the relaxation can be an issue uh, in such cases then uh, i like to combine uh, dual drug therapy that is 0.5 ml uh, ml of uh, heavy bupivacaine and say 1.5 cc of uh leo 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 anavin but uh, the spacing has to be there in both the uh, between the two injections and uh, after i give uh, heavy bupivacaine 
I would wait for another two minutes for it to settle down, and then uh, I would go for Leo Leo Vivian injection. That's all I guess. And any changes, sir, with the surgical procedure? Like uh, all uh, fracture femur will be the same, or a DHS or a fat. Uh, That's what or, I said. That's what I said. Yeah. If it is DHS or PFN, I would uh, prefer giving single drug. That hmm. is levofloxacin, uh, okay. 1.52 cc combined with the uh, uh, fentanyl. Huh. And if it is a uh, bipolar, then I would combine a uh, uh, dual drug. That is first Bice. injection of heavy levofloxacin. 0.5 cc. Wait for two minutes. Let it let the drug settle down, and then 1.5 cc of uh, levofloxacin can be given uh, to cover the higher levels. What difficulties? I mean, with hyper and isobaric, the same procedure have you faced? If you compare both. With hyper, things. with hyperbaric, definitely the onset of hypotension used to be very fast and much prolonged. in this patient with 20% ejection fraction definitely hyper hyperbaric will cause severe hypotension uh, nowadays since last 3 to 4 years i i am been giving fascia iliac a compartmental block for all the patients of neck femur the moment i give fascia iliac a block the patient's bp starts falling so i empirically start all these patients on uh, low dose uh, noradrenal infusions before i start uh, giving anything once i when the fascia iliac block is in place after 10 minutes i give the position and uh, then isobaric uh, drug doesn't cause much hypotension this is has been my observation but uh, the tapering of the iso uh, noradrenaline infusion in isobaric drug is very fast but when i when i am using hyperbaric drugs the tapering uh, takes longer time in the wards otherwise in isobaric drugs i generally taper off uh, during the surgery only generally for a femur fracture with high risk and multiple comorbidities we tend to go for blocks in the sense lumbar flexes or sciatic flexes but even lumbar flexes has given me a uh, lot of trouble with hypotension there is isobaric and ever definitely yeah definitely definitely since this patient is on anticoagulant and alternate day um, uh, dialysis, dialysis going on with heparin so lumbar plexus can be tricky in uh, this cases as well as lumbar plexus is uh, technically more demanding yeah uh, if so is the patient not on uh, any anti yeah nahi nahi go ahead if the patient if the patient was not on any anticoagulant then continuous spinal would have been a fantastic choice for this patient then next case will be the next choice will be the isobaric bibliocan then i would go for so lumbar plexus uh, so blocks are being replaced by definitely. isobaric you can say definitely if the, if the if the neuroaxial anesthesia is not contraindicated or relatively contraindicated yeah. then definitely continuous spinal and isobaric uh, bupropion has definitely uh, a better um, easier rather than say easier administration and uh, more predictability of action yeah so uh, then the uh, uh, number of patients is anxiety yes for if especially for the high risk yes so i will have to give a continuous lumbar plexus in such cases which will need me a sonography or a pns and expertise to and till days even if i am giving blocks i am more comfortable with spinal i know i can give it in one shot rather than the deeper blocks in such cases with, with such kind of patients when you don't want to fail actually yeah a private per, a private anesthetist is working Uh, as a single person we generally initially used to give more drug yeah the 20 25 ml 30 ml for yes, lumbar yes. plexus and it, it invariably used to sip into epidural spaces and, and it used to definitely cause some kind of hypotension though delayed but it used to be there and it used to be prolonged with with uh, better coaching we have reduced it to say 15 to 18 ml for lumbar plexus still sometimes if we, we are in a hurry 
uh, and we inject under pressure still uh, there is some probably a fetal space and uh, there is some hypotension even with perfectly working uh, lumbar plexus blocks so i would definitely if the neuro if the neuroaxial anesthesia is not contraindicated i would definitely go for continuous spinal or isobaric drug in such cases with noradrenaline support i want to Thanks. ask a question uh, yes, sure. yeah, final microcatheters are not available in India. So which catheter are you using for continuous spinal? For the, the pediatric epidural catheter that we are managing. We are managing with that. Though, 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 though not ideal, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I have done a lot of uh, continuous spinal. I use 18-gauge uh, epidural catheters. So there was a lot of discussion on PDPH. Uh, with continuous spinal, but in my practice, I've hardly noticed any PDPH. I keep the catheter for 24 hours. For 24 hours, yeah. And remove it after 24 hours. The tie is not. Yes. A knot is tied, and not, we just leave not, it in place for. And just uh, tie the uh, injection port, and it's just packed. Nobody touches it. Continuous spinal catheters. High time that we we have continuous spinal catheter sets available in India, actually. So it's a wonderful procedure, excellent procedure. Yeah. I... See, it is very simple. It can be tried by everyone. Actually, I wanted to ask Dr. Karma. And the results are more predictable. The results are very predictable. A lot of spinal. What is their protocol? What do they use over there? And uh, what is their protocol? If Dr. Karma can. Um, just uh, tell us about it. Do they have uh, uh, dedicated spinal catheters? Yes, of course they have. Yes, we have uh, uh, at present uh, two kinds of uh, dedicated uh, spinal uh, catheter set. And uh, each of them has advantages and uh, drawbacks. And um, one has a, a better catheter, the other one has a better needle. And we, we tend to use the one that has a better catheter, less prone to kinking or bending. Uh, but uh, um, we, use, uh, we don't use the needle uh, that comes with uh, with uh, in bundle with the, the set, and we use uh, just a simple quink needle, po quink point needle, um, because the the special sprot uh, point needle that comes with the, the the set, the dedicated set, is not performant. You have to to cut the the, the skin or to use an, an introductor and uh, it, it, it doesn't pierce. It doesn't pierce. Um, so it's it's a pity because the catheter is uh, much better um, on than the other set. Um, the other set uh, the uh, the other set catheter need a, a coverage. In, in its uh, out, outer tract on the back of the patient. Uh, we put a, 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 sheath, a sheath using a, a, a syringe um, line, tube, uh, syringe line, infusion line. Uh, we cut it at measure and uh, uh, we, we, we cover the, the outer tract of the, of the cutter with this uh, sheath with this coverage and uh, we can also um, join all this uh, all this trick to the to the intro uh, to the um, introducer uh, uh, no the um, not the filter the um, okay don't get the word the epidural epidural filter connector connector the connector bravo bravo carmen <laughs> the connector <laughs> The, okay, the connector. And so it's uh, everything is, is more uh, safe. 
But another problem is the kinking and the bending that the, the spinal catheters may have into the back, in between the, 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 the vertebrae, with, between the bones. And uh, there are um, something that we can do as a remedy, but uh, often we, we have to, not, not, not so often in, uh, in reality, but it may happen that uh, you have to, to drop the technique and uh, shift to general anesthesia for this problem or put another catheter. Uh, it's not very, very frequent, but uh, it may happen. And uh, at present, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, preparing a new set that join the advantages of uh, the one and uh, the other set uh, uh, now disposable. And uh, I hope that it will serve to, to provide the spine, continuous spinal anesthesia also in the younger patients, because uh, right now uh, the sets have a 21, uh, 22 gauge needle which is not, uh, that is not a uh, epidural to OA, but it's still a quite a large needle that can mm, give a problem with the PDPH in the youngest. And so uh, this is uh, our um, project. And uh, what else? Uh, I I heard about the uh, duration of um, of the catheter. I mean, uh, how long uh, to leave yeah. the catheter, and we we don't uh, we don't uh, uh, we we hadn't any problem uh, even for duration of uh, a week or more, and we keep the the catheter as we would do with an epidural one when the, there is. Uh, some uncertainty with the, the the result of surgery and so we keep the catheter in case of emergency in case of reopening and uh, in, in literature uh, there are um, there are some statements about a safe duration of uh, up to uh, 72 um, 96 uh, hours uh, so three four days without any growth in uh, bacterial uh, culture. So if you, if you keep well uh, your catheter, there are no uh, inf infectious problems. We, had, uh, we have had uh, no one in many, many hundred cases. Good, that's very interesting. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Yeah. Can I ask Dr. Sarnaria? Yeah, uh, yeah. They have been using, uh, hello, good evening. They have been uh, using a lot of combination for intrathecal uh, administration for all the multiple cases, like say, uh, laparoscopic people channel you are doing. Uh, for postoperative infusions, what combinations are you using? Uh, postoperative. Yes, postoperative. Yes. Uh, post are you using yeah. the same combination or the same plain ones? Um, uh, in uh, we uh, we use uh, both ropivacaine and uh, levobupivacaine, and uh, we also use uh, uh, edgy ones, midazolam. We we put midazolam yeah. in the fusion. How and how much how, how much you do you put? Oh, if you ask me now, uh, I can uh, I can give the the raw numbers. Uh, for example, uh, 100 uh, milligrams of ropivacaine in, uh, uh, in uh, let me think, in uh, 50 millimeters, in a syringe of 50 millimeters. And there we, and, and the speed uh, will be between uh, uh, 0 .0, 0 0.7 and uh, uh, one millimeter for hour. This is a general. This is a general uh, uh, recipe, how to say. And uh, if you give uh, levobupivacaine, you will use uh, less less anesthetic uh, for fifty millimeters in the syringe of a saline of a total volume, 
you will have uh, 70 milligrams of uh, levobupicaine, levobupivacaine okay. compared to the 100 of the ropivacaine. How much midazolam are you adding to this, uh, Roberto? Yeah. Pardon? How much midazolam are you adding to the uh, ropivacaine or bupivacaine in 50 ml syringe? Uh, since a long time, a long time. I don't. I didn't understand the shift. No, milligram no, of uh, midazolam. Midazolam. How much you add? Uh, One hundred milligram ropivacaine and seventy milligram um, levobupivacaine in fifty millimeter total. Yes, that is for the local anesthetic for additive. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. 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 Now I got it. Now I got it. Now yeah. I got it. Let's say that this uh, kind of uh, this kind of infusion will last uh, about uh, depending on the on the speed uh, uh, about from two to three days, okay. And then we can give uh, ten milligrams midazolam in the infusion okay. in the total in the total volume of ten milligrams midazolam. Ten milligrams, yes. Yeah. For, for for two to three days. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Slowly, that's be going very slow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I, I put a post or more than a post in the in the group with this uh, the precise uh, numbers and doses and. Uh, yes, and, we'll find out. Yes, okay. I think so. We'll find out, sir. Uh, other, otherwise, I, I will uh, write a special, yeah. special scheme again. Yeah. We yeah, would appreciate that. that. We would appreciate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, we are discussing segmental spinal now, so it'll be useful for people to revise. So the drugs used, the volume used, concentration used, yeah, uh, those will be uh, very useful. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, Roberto, and thank oh, you, Cameron. You are uh, welcome. Nish, You're welcome. Uh, we'll go on to the next case, Kala. Sir, actually, this case had an extension. Um, yeah. Breast. Yes, sir. This is for Dr. Vagilam, a 59 year old female for right breast cancer surgery, modified radical mastectomy, huge fungating mass, lots of pulmonary metastasis. She was a patient of diabetics, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and post CABG with an LBEF of 25%. This was a huge mass. This time, uh, I was practicing thoracic paravertebral block. So I went on to do the surgery. This is an x-ray uh, showing pulmonary metastasis. And I did it under a paravertebral block. I wanted to ask, uh, this was a patient post-op sitting. I want to ask Dr. Tarun Magela, how will he do it under thoracic spine? He does lots of uh, cancer surgeries under thoracic spinal. Dr. Vagelam. Yes, ma'am. First of all, I will do the complete pre anesthetic checkup for her. And uh, if any anticoagulant is uh, clopid or anything else is running on, then I will uh, stop that. Previously, there was uh, no choice. So only general anesthesia and uh, with the uh, PEC blocks are available. Now we have choice for segmental spinal. So I will explain the procedure to the patient, surgeon, and relatives. Okay, these are the risks because of the patient have pulmonary max, diabetes, hypertension, post CABG. So hemodynamically, there will be a much fluctuations under general anesthesia and post-operative uh, may lead to ventilator supports and everything. So uh, if patient is ready and convinced for that, uh, uh, only that part will be blocked and uh, you will be awake. And most time, most of the times, if you explain very well, then the patient's reluctant will not be there. They usually uh, uh, say yes to that procedure. So I will go for the segmental spinal. Before segmental spinal, I want to uh, share some of the slides for the 
thoracic uh, uh, anatomy. So, yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, you can share. So what I need to, uh, sorry. What I need to know before the segmental spinal? Nothing. Just want to help from the, your surgeon and your patient consent. We usually, we all are in comfort zone. So we have to, uh, and some of the fear zone of the thoracic spinal. But because of the, since last uh, one and uh, so half years, I am practicing of segmental spinal. So that fear and comfort zone, I have came out in the learning curve and all the faculties learned, uh, the Paliwal sir, Karmina Pulao and all the uh, Kala Madam has uh, guided me and I now come to the, this zone. So you may also come to this zone. So this is a came, uh, case of MRM. Can it be possible in a segmental? So answer is yes, it's possible. But before that, you have to just uh, know the anatomy on the thoracic supply, nerve supply, which dermatom you have to block, that you have to make uh, your study. And before that, the key of success of this whole thoracic segmental spinal is this MRI images. In this MRI images, we can predict that we can show that the code lies more anteriorly in thoracic regions compared to the lumbar region. In lumbar region, it is completely obliterated. The space is obliterated. So this is the key of success of this whole thoracic segment. The same images, MRI images in the lateral position also. We can know that there is a, there is a no gap in the lumbar region. That's for the uh, while giving the spinal anesthesia, we do in angulation of this uh, uh, patient's position. At that time also, the space will be much more. So for roughly uh, remembering at T4 level, the distance between the post, uh, posterior dura and the cord is roughly around 8 mm and at L4, it is 4 mm. So thoracic spinal is more safer than the lumbar spinal. And we usually uh, giving spinal lumbar level since years and we have very much experience. Though we get very less uh, space there. In thoracic spinal, we get more space. So the confidence level will be uh, much more for giving this thoracic spinal. In my PG days and uh, oh, most of the, all the residents have puncture, so many puncture in thoracic epidural that dura but the patient doesn't have any of motor damage or any cord damage signs. That may be the probably explanation of this uh, uh, explanation. Now, also you can remember that in thoracic level, the cord is more anterior, lumbar level, posterior, and in caudal level, almost uh, negligible. So the same uh, space is uh, more in the thoracic cavity. That, one too, that, uh, that was the take home message. So uh, it, uh, for MRM, the, I want to give a segmental spinal at T7, thoracic T7, that roughly represent the inferior anger of scapula. For thoracic spinal, it is not as usual as lumbar, lumbar spinal. You have to do angulation. So if you hit the first transverse process, and then after hitting the transverse process, just withdraw the needle, redirect it to 30 degree angles, and you will be easily reaching the subarachnoid space. Remember the distance between the skin and the uh, thoracic spinal is very less compared to the lumbar region. So you can redirect the needle, hit the transverse process. Now this is the first transverse process. Hit, uh, now you can redirect the spinal needle and you can go reach the subarachnoid space. Thank you. These are the only slides representation. Now for the case. Uh, okay. For uh, discussion, uh, conduction of the case, I will go uh, use the isobaric drug, leoenavine. As this is a fungating mass and the mass uh, is a huge one. So it may require uh, skin graft. 
so i will just uh, before proceeding i will consult the surgeon if this, uh, you want skin graft also then i will give two drug therapy or if it is a not sure then i will go simple straight forward isobaric uh, uh, leoenamine that is a bupivacin and along with that dexmedotomidin dex so uh, surgeon take usually one and one and two one to half hours in this and uh, after giving uh, this segmental i will check the level i have conducted more than 25 cases of mrf under thoracic spinal only one case is require uh, supplementation at the axillary level axillary dissection otherwise all patients are uh, have not require any supplementation or any sedation if patient want sedation then only i give sedation otherwise patients usually remain quite awake comfortably hemodynamically totally stable i supplement nasal oxygen uh, for the safety purpose i monitor it is co2 level also that will be all remaining uh, within normal limits in first two cases i have given uh, i have intubated the patient as i have given more doses for upgrading of uh, early uh, effect loss so uh, after that i am giving 7.5 mg along with the dexmed dexmed 5 microgram that only syringe rinse with the dex uh, med uh, ampules is enough for 5 mg 5 microgram no need to so the volume will be not increase so i will give 7.5 mg mg leoenamine and uh, rest of the things we are uh, comfortable or managing uh, any cases if intubus if patient goes into respiratory arrest or bradycardia hypotension we are uh, we have enough experience for managing all these things and post operatively i will for pain relief i will give uh, uh, drug i will inject the drug through the lower drain they put the drain romovec drain and i will put, uh, inject the drug from uh, that rom lower romovec drain that uh, uh, nav in our 0.5% uh, uh, bupivacin and uh, uh, along with the dexamethasone to increase the uh, more analgesic effect and that is known invasively uh, in pec uh, previously i was giving pec1 pec2 block but surgeon is uh, are not satisfied with, with that because of the that uh, duration and edema uh, of the, the drug so uh, post operatively that is a easy and convenient way to uh, prolong your analgesic effect thank you sir uh, so in this respect uh, which is more safer i mean thorac thoracic spinal uh, is is it more safer with t9 t10 or t67 with your uh, mri really? and cross sectional studies which is more safer in terms of new uh, neuraxial injury t7 uh, is preferably uh, i prefer always t7 as uh, it is easily rem uh, we can reach easily from the inferior angle of scapula we can mark easily and uh, after giving local and patients uh, somewhat uh, in, uh, sitting position the space is more in t7 level compared to the t4 level uh, yes. so so i am much comfortable i have given one in uh, t6 level also but uh, t7 level is uh, i think uh, is a preferred one have you any time checked for the cervical root involvement or with the needle prick yeah no patient is not complain of anything yeah. uh, any motor numbness or sensory loss in the limbs or anything else uh, and uh, post operative patients all movements of the legs and abdomen are they are remaining uh, spare so patients hemodynamically very much comfortable hardly two three patient require atropin or some 5 yes. uh, mg mefentrin or like that that is easily manageable yeah in my experience what i i have given done with uh, ropivacin for breast surgeries where uh, post operatively i checked the motor is good i mean patient can move the legs and uh, they can hold my fingers very tightly you know but the sensory loss with needle prick if i saw uh, was almost up to the clavicular level the up to elbow and uh, uh, knee and which uh, i kept on checking every 15 minutes the regression complete regression took around 2 hours but motor was absolutely fine patient was talking she had no complaints but sensory loss was uh, with just 
ml of 0.75 percent propivacaine and T60. So maybe we have. I have used only that leo of propivacaine. Yeah. Because at the thoracic level, the fluid displacement is more than at the thoracic lumbar level. Yeah. So you need lesser volumes. Yeah. Okay. Let's... Anybody wants to add? Yeah. Can you add uh, some adjuvant? No, no, I did not add adjuvants. I uh, gave, uh, I mean, local infiltration uh, post-operatively. That was enough because for breast, they all almost the pain is less. They cut the nerves because of the uh, transactional uh, incision. So the pain isn't much. It's the more of stretch uh, pain, which, which is taken care with the multimodal analysis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Carmen has actually messaged, and uh, his uh, message was that it's T4, T7 um, spinal with 4 to 10 milligrams of bifuvicane. Uh, Ropivicane, uh, 6 to 12 milligrams is his dose, and he gives his as 2 milligram boluses. Um, that was the message from Carmen. Uh, if you like, uh, if, can I share the screen for one uh, slide? Yes, Just, uh, yes, yes. Sure, sure. yes Robert, you can. Okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to add something uh, to what Dr. Tarun Vagela said, mm. and uh, maybe many of you have already seen this slide that I shared in the group. This is all the possibility in which- You're not uh, uh, seeing it, uh, Roberto, you need to double click. Yeah, that's it, yeah. That's it. Uh, yeah. These are all the possibilities in which uh, 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 the, you, sh you, you, go, you go straight at lumbar level because there is, no the, there is no the core there, but actually the core may be there, may be under your needle. Uh, these are the percentages because of uh, anatomical reasons and because of mistakes in counting in, uh, in finding the, the level of puncture. So uh, you you see that you you can see that lumbar level is not as uh, as safe as one uh, as we are uh, taught normally. And uh, what I always say is that the technique of uh, of a spinal puncture is more important than the level at which you you put it. You, you must have a, a correct uh, and safe technique also at lumbar, lumbar level. Thank you. Uh, you can stop uh, sharing now, Robert. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. There's Anything a question. Else? There's a question. Uh, yeah. Can we administer hyperbaric bupivacaine and thoracic spinal for MRM? Yeah. Uh, Kala, you yeah, need to have your mic on. Yes, yes, you can do uh, it, but then you have to go low on the volume because the drug at the thoracic level spreads more faster than the lumbar region. So what? Uh, how we count at lumbar region, uh, you, you give 3 ml for a... Uh, uh, covering around six segments here, you just need to give one or a maximum 1.5 for hyperbaric. And you give it in lateral position and make the patient supine image. The curvature is at T5, T6. So the drug spreads up to around T1, T2. But then you, you get uh, bradycardia, you may have a bit more hypotension. You have to be careful. You are at least because you are, uh, you are going to block the uh, cardio accelerator fibers and it's going to be intense as well, I think. But you have to remember that you can't be doing the, uh, uh, you know, segmental spinal at thoracic level in sitting a position with hyperbaric. The drug will just gravitate down. So if you want to maintain the level, then you need to actually do it in the little position. Uh, obviously with the hyperbaric, you have to keep the 
uh, operative side dependent. But it is possible, but with less drug. Yeah. I have done uh, MRNs in under epidurals in the past. Okay. Um, and to those all who are wondering ki whether we are injuring uh, spinal cord at the thoracic level, but if you see lumbar region, uh, when a, many a times you have felt that patient complaining of paresthesia when, when you are with the needle you are injuring. Yeah. Because the cord is more to, uh, dorsally at the lumbar area than at the uh, thoracic level. And T9 and 10, it begins to go more dorsally compared to T67. So the more higher, that is a T67, you are more safer than a T9, T10. Okay. And the other thing is, I think so, so many people, I did put this as a... Uh, uh, you know, as a question on the group, uh, uh, how many people think they are actually at the at the level? Do they think they are actually at L3, L4? Uh, it, has yes. been seen, it has been seen that people are never at L, L3, L4 interspace uh, where they think there is no spinal cord. Uh, most yeah, people are actually at L1, L2 level. Yeah. So they do actually give uh, uh, the injection, lumbar injections, at a point where you can easily injure the uh, spinal cord. And there are actually instances of uh, people injecting local anesthetic into the spinal cord at lumbar region. But there isn't any of cases of uh, people causing uh, thoracic uh, you know, spinal cord injury uh, when they have breached the dura during a thoracic epidural, which is very common. And that too with a large needle, I mean, you're using uh, 16 uh, gauge uh, epidural needle is huge. So I think that uh, misconception has to slowly disappear uh, that <laughs> with lumbar, lumbar you cannot uh, cause uh, uh, spinal injury. No, most people actually can cause that. It's known thing. Okay, moving on to next one, Kala. Yes. May I add one line? Yes, madam. Uh, Ma'am, uh, with this technique, uh, I used uh, my surgeon. Uh, he put the fourth chemo port yesterday without any local anesthesia, only with this thoracic segmental. I just want to add that. Yeah, even chemo port you managed. Yeah, yeah. That's what I said. Can I add the something? After yes, sir. Please. Uh, for breast surgeries, there are so many options. Yeah. I mean, for post op analgesia. So the surgeon can actually give PEC1, PEC2 block during surgery. Even he can give this uh, serratus anterior plane block during surgery. And that can be utilized along with segmental spinal. So using hyperbaric drugs in segmental for breast. Yeah. You need to keep the patient for almost 10-15 minutes in unilateral position. And even after that, it is bound to spread to other side. And with hyperbaric drugs, the selective spinal is not there. I mean, there is uh, not much differentiation between sensory and motor. The motor component is quite heavy with hyperbaric. So the advantages yeah. are lost. Yeah. So it's always better to have either isobaric or if the patient is very frail and this thing, you can even use hypobaric drugs. The hypobaric are much safer than isobaric, but the time duration limit is very little with this. And then again, you have to keep the patient in lateral position for some time with head up tilt. Yeah. So it's time consuming. The safest one is to use isobaric drugs, low volume. Yeah. And most of it is mostly sensory. So not much hemodynamic fluctuations and not no respiratory problems, even with high levels of block, even with dermatomes involving C5, 6, 7. And you need that much involvement for breast surgeries. I mean, I have uh, put up a video testing the uh, finger grip, hmm. uh, grip strength in the little finger. I have posted that video on anesthetics. The patient had no sensation on the little finger, but the grip strength was good, indicating that only sensory component was involved. Hmm. And the patient was very comfortable, comfortably talking and she was even moved to stretcher by herself after the surgery? I think uh, the you have to again uh, come back to again 
that you need to discuss with the surgeon what exactly his requirements are. Now, if yes. you have a, have a cancer, you need to know what extent uh, they are going to go for. Are they going to take out the pectorals? Is this a radical ma you know, mastectomy? Or is this a simple, you know, because if it is going to be just taking out the breast tissue, you don't require a muscle relaxation. Yes, There's so no superficial surgery. Yeah. yeah, superficial, yeah. But like this is a fungating mass, they might want to actually go more extensive, even into the axilla for that matter, where you actually need to actually have a level up to T1. Actually, I did a similar case recently, but in parabatical because the fungating mass, the fungating infection was extending yeah. till the back of the patient. Yeah. So I was scared to give segmental spinal, which I am very much favored, actually. Yeah. But I gave parabatical block in that patient, yeah. just for the fear of uh, getting the infection inside. Yeah. You well, can combine uh, it with the epidurals if if you think the duration is uh, going to be longer going to be long rather than increasing the dose of the intrathecal drug, you can better combine it with epidurals. Yes. Yeah. The uh, other, other thing is that I think the PEG blocks are going to go off um, out of favor. Uh, the surgeons don't like it. Uh, the local anesthetic uh, in the space, in the uh, plane, uh, they cause a problem with the use of diathermy. Uh, there is risk of, uh, you know, seeding of the breast uh, the malignant yes. cells they are worried about uh, because you might be going through the malignant tissues. So you need to be away, away from the, uh, you know, the site of mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, so uh, erectus spinae are obviously uh, coming into vogue. More and more people are using. You could put catheters. You can combine it with obviously segmental spinal and you can always put a erectus later on. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, can we move on, uh, Kala, now? Kala, I think uh, she's having problem. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, next. I can Just one more question. Yeah. For axillary dissection, what else has to be supplemented? Uh, no need to supplement anything. Uh, usually, the surgery finishes within a one to one and a half hours, and that time the effect will last uh, uh, till that time. And uh, only one patient requires uh, supplementation, and that uh, I have given dexcat. Uh, remaining amount of dexmedrine and ketamine supplementation. The uh, thing is that uh, people forget that you can still, uh, surgeons can still use local infiltration. That's not that just because you have given spinal does not mean that they cannot use, uh, uh, you know, local anesthetic. They can still use local anesthetic in the axilla uh, for dissection if the level is not uh, to the their level, uh, you know, satisfaction. Uh, yes, Kala, go on. Kala, your mic is off. Kala, you need to switch on your mic. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, so this is a vaginal hysterectomy patient with severe Parkinsonism, post CABG with an LVA of 25%. Will I give isobaric? Dr. Karun, Dr. Rao, anybody can do. Right. The question is, would you actually give a spinal anesthesia in a patient who's having severe Parkinsonism? That should be the first question before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But I want to give. Prefer. Uh, we don't give severe Parkinsonism. We sedate the patient, but uh, yeah. we can give spinal. There is no issue in um, private practice. A small nursing home usually they post the, that type of patient without. So, uh, consultation pre anesthetic checkup to us. We directly see the patient on the table and there is no chance to postpone the patient. Yeah. Okay. So, will you go what 
if at all you want to give a drug uh, spinally, what will you give them in this case? If, uh, simple uh, isobaric BPO can segmental can be given uh, uh, in the lower down and uh, surgeon is fast and with an instructome usually they finish within one hour. What so, about sacral sparing then? Uh, yeah, in the dual therapy, uh, dual drugs, this is a uh, plain uh, uh, vaginal, only vaginal hysterectomy. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, uh, drug uh, hyperbaric uh, can be given, uh, but the very less volume. Less volume. 1.5 1, 1. is better than an isobaric. Yeah, uh, better than isobaric and uh, allow to and see for a while patients for 15 to 30 seconds. So more drug will be settled in the down. Because uh, in vaginal hysterectomy, they require level at uh, uh, almost up to the T6 level. Yeah. So uh, do such cases at uh, smaller nursing home levels without uh, backup? Uh, backup, uh, uh, usually there will be a monitor and a small trolley will be there. Without, uh, an, uh, there is no hi-fi gadgets uh, available at that. Uh, any small nursing home. Any... That's what, that's what. Sorry, uh, guys. Uh, what backup are you talking about for vaginal hysterectomy? Are you talking about this case or are you talking this about case, this, case. This, this particular ICU case? backup, you mean? Yeah, okay. There's no need to for ICU backup. Minimum standard uh, monitors uh, are there, then if, uh, we can conduct that case. No issue. And what about uh, chloroprocaine here? Uh, not, not okay. Vaginal hysterectomy will uh, not be enough duration wise. Yeah. Hey, vaginal hysterectomy requires good amount of stretching, good amount of uh, relaxation. Good space. Plus, yeah. Parkinsonism patient will have rigidity. Mm -hmm. I would expect. For no position, difficulty. also she will be troublesome. I would not go for isobaric uh, preparation in this case. Yes. Definitely go for a low dose uh, hyperbaric. Yeah. Or a dual. Doctor Nita. Doctor Nita. Uh, I would give a hyperbaric low volume spinal and combine it with epidural because uh, uh, vaginal hysterectomy takes some time also. Hmm. It doesn't finish in 60 minutes in our institution. Hmm. <laughs> so I would combine it with epidural. I have one gynecologist finishing 25 minutes. Yes, yes. some of them do that. But, that uh, all depends on your confidence with the surgeon. I mean, I, my surgeons are also very good. They finish in less than an hour, yes. But they are, uh, say, 7, 8 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. Very few Sorry, what are you talking no. about? And this is, is this a laparoscopic assisted or a... Or a no, no, it's a plain vaginal hysterectomy uh, with a prolapse patient. Okay. Uh, may or may not require an EP repair. I was just talking about perianal surgeries where isobaric is not the choice. Yes. It's more towards hyperbaric. That's what I wanted to convey here. So if it is a short procedure, less than 60 minutes, then chloroprocaine is a very good drug. Yes, but it chloroprocaine, when I've seen, low, it's yeah. causing more, uh, you, you need around 2.5 ml minimum to reach. Yes, even if you're giving 2.5, but patient uh, patients remain hemodynamically stable. And I have used it in high-risk patients and uh, uh, they're very, they remain very stable. I don't know, madam. My experience is, I mean, I'm not very happy with the pelvic uh, effect of uh, isobaric, whether it is chloroprocaine or um, dupivacaine. So Can I add something? First day, I would. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, uh, the bad. problem with isobaric drugs at lumbar levels is it takes some time to act at lumbar levels. Hmm. It's not like thoracic levels where the CSF is low. The nerve roots are short and thin, but here the uh, roots are thicker and the isobaric drugs, they take some time to act. And time most of act. the time, the anesthetist think that the effect is not there for lumbar sacral root. It may take almost 10 minutes for isobaric drugs to act at lumbar levels. But for uh, prolapse patient, uh, there is not much of pulling unless it is a NDVH, I mean non-descent vaginal hysterectomy, where you require a lot of push and pull. 
So this can be very well done in hyperbaric drugs. Or if the surgeon is very fast, chlorofluorocaine can be a good choice. With chlorofluorocaine, 2.5 to 3 ml is sufficient enough. And below 15 milligram, it is a no effect dose. I mean, you cannot use chlorofluorocaine below 1.5 ml. Yes, it yeah. is a no dose effect. I mean, no, uh, what you can call it. No effect dose. <laughs> no effect dose. Suboptimal. Yeah. So chlorofluorocaine will be it... ideal for uh, within 45 minutes cases. Yeah, if it is like within 45 minutes. Like a perianal fistula, abscess. Yes, yes. Chlorofluorocaine is very good. Yeah. Even isobaric LeoVPA can, can be used, but only thing you have to keep in mind is it will take some time to act and for onset of effect. Yes. And you need to give at lower spaces only. If you give it a higher spaces, unnecessary high uh, segments will be involved and lumbosacral sparing will be there with low dose. So use final catheter? Pardon? For this case, final catheter. Yes, uh, can be used. I have used only epidural catheters only because the spinocats are not available. 18 gauge uh, epidural catheters. Uh, once or twice when there was accidental dural puncture, I converted it to continuous spinal. And once or twice intentionally, like for a patient with uh, this, uh, what do you call, cardiomyopathy. That time I used uh, continuous spinal. Because low doses can be given to achieve the yes, same. Yes, titrated doses can be given. Yes. In that case, That's what we do is case, initial uh, dose. Yeah. I'll go for the next case. There uh, you can... It, it uh, can once be, again, Kala, there yes, is a sir. comment from uh, Carmen. It says, according uh, to him, he would use uh, ropivacaine, uh, 15 to 18 milligrams at L1, L2, uh, along yes. with fentanyl. Uh, 20 micrograms, or he would use isobaric bupivacaine, uh, 12 to 15 milligrams. Uh, that is around probably, uh, you know, uh, three mLs uh, with 20 micrograms of fentanyl. And he does say that he would probably use epidural along uh, with uh, isobaric uh, bupivacaine. So that was a comment from him. Yeah, let's move on to next one. Yes. Are you sharing the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, I think we are on the last case now, the, yes, yes. Uh, number eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Next one. Yeah. 55-year-old uh, female patient was listed for the removal of DHS screw which had come out. And then uh, a bipolar hip arthroplasty was planned as a redo surgery. She had mild uh, mitral stenosis when the DHS initially was done five years ago under epidural. But now she developed moderate to severe uh, mitral stenosis. And... Uh, she was diagnosed as a rheumatic heart disease. With having global left ventricular hypokinesia, mild mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, moderate ulnary artery uh, hypertension, and dilated LA, and moderately compromised LV systolic function. This patient was taken up uh, for... Uh, under blocks and 15 uh, ml of uh, xylocaine, uh, plain xylocaine rather, not even adrenaline, was 2 percent, was given at lumbar plexus and for sciatic plexus block, and she just arrested, revived, and the case was postponed. How can we do it differently, Dr. Palevan? Will continuous spinal would have been beneficial than blocks or isobaric? Yeah. Yes, uh, this time also it can be done under graded epidural. Mm. Uh, along with that, you can use either a combined spinal epidural with very low dose of isovaric uh, drug or even when doing under continuous spinal, you can use either a isobaric or even hypobaric drug because the patient will be in a lateral position. 
so that will keep the hemodynamics perfectly stable uh, with the intrathecal catheter you can use hypovaric drugs as required or even isovaric low dose drugs uh, kala yes sir uh, you said this patient actually had attempted uh, the surgery under lumbar and sacral plexus with 2% lignocaine yes 2% and a mixture of i mean 15 ml each mixture of 0.5% uh, uh, and 0.5% uh, bupivacaine and 2% plain xylocaine and she arrested so, they checked yes. the and uh, lump and 15 ml each uh, 15 ml at the lumbar plexus and 10 ml at the sciatic uh, plexus so obviously she would have got intubated ventilated so yes this come up come she up. got intubated ventilated and uh, third fourth day she was extubated yeah this But was the case, case of, the, yeah. this is a case of total spinal this yes. has got nothing to do with lumbar or sacral epidural dura because it does not cause as much problem this is a person who has actually had a total spinal from a uh, i think two medial a lumbar lumbar plexus okay. yeah so this is uh, <laughs> it, i think this is one of the complications people have to be aware of yes this kind of blocks yeah so yeah coming coming back to the case whether this can be done with an isobaric uh yeah uh, dr aliwal dr nita yes i already said can be done very well with isobaric drugs uh, advantage is you can directly keep the patient in operative site i mean yeah. operative side up and give spinal and start in the same position or so you can what, combine it with at what pardon? level would you give your spinal in this case then at lower levels l2 l3 l2 regular levels And there was no need to dose, give it a uh, dose and volume dose around just 1.2 to 1.5 ml after giving initial block i usually combine it with fascia iliaca compartment block mm -hmm. and i haven't seen any fluctuations like dr tendulkar said he notices some fall in blood pressure but i have never noticed any fall in blood pressure with ficb mm -hmm. so i usually make the patient comfortable with ficb and then give the patient operative position and then give spinal and start the surgery the dose usually i use is 1.2 to 1.5 ml in such cases and it works for around 1.5 to 2 hours any uh, the, cardiac obstructive i mean uh, valvular disease or uh, uh, cardiac myo obstructive cardiomyopathy is an oil spinal is yes i had done one case uh, severe aortic stenosis case that mm -hmm. i did in uh, hypovaric drug Okay. Yeah. I kept the patient in lateral position with uh, head low tilt, mm. and used a uh, hypovaric drug, just one point five mL of the drug, and three point five mL of distilled water, and used three point five mL of that diluted mm. drug. That means mm. it was around four point five to five milligram of total dose. Okay. And asked the surgeon to finish it within, I mean, one to one point. Uh, two hours. That was a yeah. duration limit is there with hypovaric drug because the, the center was such that there was no facility of any epidural or such things. Even boils was not there. So, what is the extent of spread you get uh, with the uh, such a low dose of isobaric? Because if you are looking at uh, doing a it depends depends on the or a bipolar which. i would for me i would think of uh, you know covering uh, segments from t12 uh, to less 4 because you need to uh, cover we just give 10 to 15 degrees head low tilt keep the yeah. operative side up and yeah. keep in that position because yeah. this is a operative position only for this patient yeah. so no need to change the position that remains as a hypovaric drug only otherwise you have to keep the patient for 15 to 20 minutes in that position for it to remain unilateral yes but but that's what done even breast I mean, surgery is what I have done even breast surgery in hypovaric drugs yes then my question was how is the how extensive is the spread suppose you are actually giving injection usually it is sufficient around t10 below t10 it is there 
and lower sufficient for that surgery lower extent only problem is it is only sensory i mean yeah most of the things they may require some sedation for uh, extensive pulling and these things that's because that's, the dose is quite low yeah most of these uh, fracture patients are elderly and uh, relaxation required is not usually much. not a issue so uh, they do well is, with very low doses just that, about 1 ml with fentanyl of even hyperbaric it keeps the patient stable i have i have it's seen right. people struggling even elderly people struggling to get especially because they need to actually it depends on the prosthesis they use and they require for reduction uh, they struggle uh, sometimes because they need you can't have a uh, wrong size hip uh, which can go easily they need to be very uh, precise in the size of hip so people do struggle even with elderly patients in 80 90 years old so it's not just Uh, the muscle relaxation. I think it's other things as well. So you do need yes, other things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have people like if you know holding the leg and <laughs> doing and turning it, all kind of maneuvers uh, they use. So it can it can be uh, quite a ordeal uh, for both surgeons. And so that's why I was actually wondering uh, whether uh, the low dose uh, antibiotic uh, would be a sufficient for this kind of surgeries with isobaric drugs it is not only sufficient but there are many advantages that you can select any position for giving spinal yeah you can use sitting position and better is to use in lateral position surgeries directly operative position exactly operative. you can directly give the operative position that yeah. saves around 15 20 minutes of yours yeah dr nitha was going to say it also remains comfortable yeah you want to add something dr nitha Uh, no, I have said that uh, we we'll use very low dose, and they are frail patients, and they do quite well. Yeah. yeah. So I would like to add. Anybody else want to yes, add? Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, check me. Uh, yes, I have done cases in uh, continuous spinal epidural, uh, old uh, female, and uh, with very low dose, and uh, just one top up was required, and the patient was relatively stable throughout because of the low dose they used. So mm. she was very comfortable. Mm-hmm. With the isobaric, what I found is they take time to give the position because they aren't relaxed that early. So whatever fifteen minutes I gain um, earlier uh, for the position, but then the patient doesn't give in on the fracture table, and they are uh, trying to reduce with the CM. So a bit of uh, hyperbaric uh, in the initial stage allows me to give the position immediately on the fracture table. the reduction is complete and meanwhile the isobaric starts acting so this will save those that time fracture table is more for dhs and uh, yes you know, for bipolar and yeah. yeah yeah okay i think yeah. uh, we will uh, go for the video so session so we come to the last part yeah one okay. promise uh, sorry one promise should yeah. be taken from the surgeon that he'll do non cemented bipolar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for this case non cemented bipolar should be done yeah yeah or they will case. do any promise for to get this patient on <laughs> yes yes i think uh, we also have to actually look at the uh, quality of life of the patient when you actually do um, uncemented uh, kind of uh, bipolars in those cases uh, there is instability is there uh, so that is if the patient actually has very good quality uh, life then uh, they might want to actually think of uh, a different kind of prosthesis which is basically the head is part of the uh, total hip replacement thing so it has got the calcium hydroxy appetite hey. uh, coating uh, so it helps you rather tears me kaafi kuch okay yeah okay let's uh, move on to the next session uh, kala yes yeah. i think this is the video section Yes, a video session. Um, Dr. Tanija, Dr. Nita.
this is a lab cholecystectomy uh, given at uh, spinal given at T10. Mm. Shall I play the yeah. video? Is just showing that uh, we do the surface marking first and uh, after giving local anesthesia, as you are introducing the needle, you go slowly millimeter by millimeter, and the moment you get the give, you disconnect and uh, once the CSF comes, check the angle, you know, angle is always a bit acute for thoracic spinal. And once you check the CSF, you give about two ml, 1.5 ml plus fentanyl, two ml of levobupivacaine. So this is just a small video showing thoracic spinal. So one of the questions, I think one of the, uh, you know, uh, members of the group had actually asked, uh, what do you give for us local or uh, additive? Obviously, I think uh, the, I'm sure the answer is that we always give the local first and the additive next. Anybody doing in a different order? Kala or Dr. Yeah. It's always local first, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, Dr. Tarun Magela's uh, presentation in MRM in patients with uh, pulmonary meds. Dr. Magela? Tarun? Yeah, Tarun, yeah, your mic is off. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, this is a case of MRM with pulmonary meds. So, marking, surface marking is done for the inferior angle of scapula, we present the T7 space. So in sitting position, uh, at the T7 level, after local anesthesia, given uh, sub, uh, subarachnoid space uh, puncture, and injecting the drug 1.5 ml, that levovenamine, uh, along with, in this case, I have given fentanyl. The ch level check, effect lasted, then then incision is, uh, that pa patient is moving all limbs, intraoperatively also, patient is comfortable, showing uh, tongue also, and hemodynamically totally stable. I have monitored ETCO2 also in this case. And this is a uh, serratus now they are uh, doing, and this is a closer with the drain, uh, injected 20 ml of enamine, and now patient has moved herself in the stature, and totally pain-free. Um, Dr. Vagila's another laparoscopic hysterectomy under spinal. So this is a uh, demonstration of two level two dual drug therapy. So first of all, uh, uh, at T10 level mark, local given, then T9 said 10 selected, then spinal uh, by little by bit by bit, then free flow of CEO surface there, that injected 0.5 ml of of this is a 2.5 milligram of heavy bupivacaine slowly. After that, stilet is put again in the needle, and uh, another drug that is levonavin and fentanyl is prepared. That we are using that vial. So for before using that, we have to uncork the that. We cannot withdraw the, from the needle for the safety of um, um, uh, the aseptic precautions. Now that the dual drugs has been injected after 30 to 40 seconds, and there is patient is totally comfortable, and one nasal uh, oxygen and one is for the ETCO to monitor. The patient is moving the limb after the surgery. Okay, thank you so much, sir. And Tarun, yes, sir. Can we just uh, clarify that you said that after you are given the heavy bupivacaine. Yeah. You put the stillet back. Is that because you need to wait for around two minutes? Uh, not exactly two minutes. I usually uh, allow for one uh, that only we prepare the dry drugs. We uncork that levonavine, take the drug and mix with the fentanyl at that time only. And for uh, no leakage of CSF, we have to put stillet again. Because if we uh, remain, uh, put that syringe inside, the syringe weight is there. So you, you may miss the uh, you may withdraw okay. that needle may be withdrawn uh, by the weight of the dead syringe. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, but also like uh, 
what has been discussed today, it was that, uh, you know, after giving heavy BP, we can usually people wait for one to two minutes. Yeah, but two minutes, that's what yeah, I think. That is so a far. more time. Yeah, Paliwal sir can explain that. I, I usually wait for only 30 to 40 seconds. That only okay. 5 ml is uh, sufficient to settle for uh, uh, yeah. settle, settlement. That time is, I think. Okay, okay, that's fine. I usually is, don't wait. There, you don't wait. Okay. I wait because, yeah. sir, uh, sir, even hello? 8 milligram is enough to. Uh, hello? Yeah, yes. even 8 milligram is enough to cause uh, a drug hyperbaric. Usually one ampule contains 80 milligrams of dextrose. But from the literature, it, is, it says that 8 milligram is enough to cause. So if I'm giving isobaric very soon after the hyperbaric, my that isobaric can behave as hyperbaric because for half ml contains 10 milligrams of dextrose. Yes, uh, by the time you inject the drug, uh, isobaric drug, the initial hyperbaric drug, which is just 0.5 ml, mm. that usually settles down because you are giving in a sitting position. Okay. And even if that mixes, it uh, makes uh, I mean, no issues with this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's very clear then. Okay. Because the lumbosacral volume is quite uh, mm -hmm. big as compared to the other CSF volume. Okay, yeah, we can move on to the next one, Kala. This is just summarizing, which I'll yeah. be doing. Yeah. Shall I go in? Sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Finish with the questions. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Just to, yeah. Now, um, seeing the isobaric levobupivacaine 0.5% is equal to your opivacaine. 0.75%. Both are purely levoisomers. They are both less cardiotoxic and neurotoxic. The clinical profile is similar to your racemic bupivacaine. In the potency, the racemic bupivacaine is more than the levo bupivacaine, which is more than the ropivacaine. So you have to remember in terms of your motor blockade and relaxation. These are what is available in the Indian market. The 4 ml ropivacaine is not available now. Uh, in, in that place, we get a uh, 20 ml uh, dose, which the remaining can be used for blocks. The intrathecal spinal use, the racemic bupivacaine has a similar action to levo bupivacaine in clinical uh, this, and potency. Ropivacaine has nearly half the potency because it's less lipid soluble. Ropivacaine has good motor preservation as compared to bupivacaine, so patient can be ambulatory sooner. And advantages of isobaric is remarkable cardiovascular stability, even with high levels of block. Low dose gives uh, the blocks are more uh, sensory than motor, providing select or uh, segmental spinal. Onset is gradual, as in epidural, so you have to wait for some time for the action to set in. It preserves the muscle tone power, and recovery of motor loss is quicker, hence useful for daycare surgery or ambulatory surgeries. There is less sympathetic blockade, leading to less hypotension and early bladder control. So you need not catheterize the patient. The voiding is earlier. Disadvantages is once administered, the level cannot be modified with head low, head high, or any other position. There is sacral sparing, so you have to take care of that. Unlike hyperbaric, it cannot be administered blindly for any surgery. You have to know your dermatomes well. The less muscle relaxation with low doses that you have to keep in mind and shorter duration of action. You need to know your surgical anatomy and the dermatomes very well before and the surgical extent. You have to discuss it with the surgeon and decide the level of injection based on the surgery. For intra-abdominal procedures, you need at least T4 level. Lower intra-abdominal procedures, T6. Lower extremities with a tunicate or testicular and ovarian surgical procedures up to T8. Hip surgeries, vaginal or uterine surgical procedures, bladder and prostate surgical procedures, T10. And lower extremity surgery without a tunicate, T12. There is never a right way to anesthetize a patient, especially high risk. What we are 
uh, uh, discussing here is an option to expand the boundaries of your regional anesthesia by preferring spinal anesthesia in a new way. Thank you. I'm ending this wonderful session. I would like to thank my coordinators, Dr. Preeti, Dr. Chetna, my esteemed panelists, Dr. Rao, Dr. Neeta, Dr. Richa, Dr. Ganesh, and Dr. Tarun for their valuable time during this COVID period. I thank Dr. Paliwal, Dr. Robert, and Dr. Carmen for their relentless efforts for segmental spinal and valuable support. And above all, wonderful uh, Dr. Shiv sir for making all this possible. Thank you, sir. Special thanks to Dr. Shiv for making it possible. Yes, sir. No, no, for, uh, I mean, you are the pioneer, sir, for uh, yeah, segmental spinal. Cooperation spider. of everyone was excellent. And I must say, Dr. Shiv was the key in yes. initiation and the progression of all the symposium. And Dr. Carmine and uh, uh, Robert added a Robert. nice flavor to this symposium. Yes, I I think we should make a collective effort to tell uh, this uh, Dr. Company. Shiv, your, uh, sir, your uh, oh. mic is muted. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not to stop making this isobaric uh, preparation, especially Ligo Bukwek. Sir, company open the company. Stakeholders. <laughs> I have already conveyed the message to the pharma companies new and uh, superior. Yeah, then yeah, then yeah. But they have started uh, manufacturing these 10 ml ampoules. And yeah. 4 ml also. Yeah. 4 ml, also. 4 ML, also. 4 ML uh, did not get it, but 10 ml they have started manufacturing it. Yeah, but they told me that uh, they will also provide 4 ml within few days. Yeah, they have to, they have no option because now so many people <laughs> are using it. it. So many people are using it. Increasing After demand. This that, uh, increased at least uh, 25 to 30 percent more. Hello, you forgot to mention one more case discussion. Yes, sir. Fine surgery under spinal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We've been we doing a lot of yes, I mean, that yes, is yes. being done, done by a lot of people just with uh, hyperbaric as well. So it's not anything. Uh, yeah, just with advantage with isobaric is the patient can turn himself to prone yeah. position after giving yeah. spinal. Yeah. And I have shown that video on Facebook. The leg movement. Because you need four or five people. Yes. You need four or five people to turn the patient prone. But here yeah. with isovaric drugs, patient, the patient can. can turn himself up to a prone position. Yeah. Okay. Or you can actually give the uh, spinal. Spinal and prone. prone. Yes, I was yes. to tell that. Can yeah. the, no, no, can sir, the, it's uh, actually easy. In the on. And uh, when you are on the bolster, you get a nice convexity. The spinal is easier. Yes. Hmm. And they but have the a CR available, so the they guide you. Yeah. Okay. I think that is for another day. I think it's been a long day, guys. And uh, yes, sir. like I said, okay, thank uh, you very thank much. You, thank everyone. you, all the thank coordinators, all. Uh, panelists, and our special uh, guest, uh, Carmen. Roberto and uh, Dr. Palma. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to end end the live uh, thing now. And uh, no.